AIT. When you get up in the morning and look in the mirror, you see your eyes, mouth, teeth, hair, ears, and nose. Your muscles and bones give you a real good place for you to wear your clothes. You've got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart. And what we think and feel is a very important part of how we put together, why we do what we do, why I look like me and you look like you. It's a bunch of neat stuff. It's fun to know. Watch, listen, and learn with head to toe. show. This caterpillar is the beginning of a butterfly. This is the beginning of the alphabet. These seeds are the beginning of flowers. This pine cone is the beginning of um, the beginning of a tree. These tadpoles are the beginning of frogs. Are you beginning to get the idea? That's what we're going to talk about on this show, beginnings. Especially the beginnings of things that are alive, like animals and people. People like you guys and you. And here's a good place to start. Okay, who knows what this is the beginning of? A bird? Bird? Chicken. Chicken, yeah. Breakfast. Well, it's, this one's not going to become breakfast, Christopher, because inside it, there's a chicken. An egg doesn't look like much on the outside, but inside that chicken's waiting to be born. Now, you guys already knew that, right? And that's because we've been watching chicks hatch from their eggs in our incubator. Let's have a look. The egg is like a little house, protecting the unborn bird. Inside of it, there's enough food to help the chicken grow and grow until she's strong enough to break through the shell. It takes her a little while, but soon she's free and ready to see the world. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Boy, this guy's pretty tired. He just, just came out of the egg. Quiet. Yeah, we saw him. One that's quiet? This okay. one's quiet. Okay, let's see if we can get this guy up for you here. Here, hold your hand up. Hold your hand this up. one's trying to get out. Oh, he is. This one's trying to get yeah, out. Yeah, there's one being hatched right there. Okay, hold on to him. Just hold, hold him up. Okay, I'll take this guy here. Oh. One has red on him. Red on him? What's it feel like? What's it feel like? Warm. Yeah, they're warm, aren't they? They don't? Yeah, yours has got the feathers coming up. It's getting kind of fluffy, isn't it? He's looking more like a chicken. Mine's still kind of wet. Just came out of the egg. Isn't this amazing? These chicks are only a few minutes old. Just a little while ago, they were inside an egg. Well, let's put them back inside the incubator so that they'll stay warm, and their feathers will fluff up, and they'll turn into chickens. Can you name any other birds besides chickens? Robins. Robins. Eagles. Eagles, yeah. Ducks. Ducks, yeah. Goose. Goose, that's a big one, yeah. Joey. Joey. Joey? Who's Joey? My, my parakeet. Ah, your parakeet. Another bird. And all of those birds are really different, aren't they? Some are really big, like eagles and geese. And some are really small, like robins. But they all had their beginnings in an egg. Okay, here's another question for you. Here's somebody you might recognize. Gertrude. Yeah, hi, Gertie. <laughs> this is Gertrude the guinea pig. Yeah, hi, Gertie. She's talking to us, too. Yeah, say hello okay. to Gertrude. Sure. Hi, Gertrude. Now, where do you think Gertrude came from? Hmm? The store. Well, yeah, she may have. We did get her at the pet store, yes. But where do you think she was born? Do you think she came out of an egg? I don't know. Yeah. Tell us. Well, some animals aren't born from eggs. They're born by coming directly out of their mother's body. And it's an amazing thing to watch. Would you guys like to see an animal actually being born? Yeah. Sure. Here's a film of a baby whale being born. It came directly out of its mother's body. Her mother's name is Shamu, and she was born at SeaWorld. Let's watch. Wonderful? And it's amazing how that baby whale was born right out of its mother's body. And you know something else? That is how you and you were born as well. I'll go I'll get, get it. it! Hi, Monica. Hi, guys. Got anything to eat? Hi, Monica. Come on in. 
I'm already in, Bob. Oh, yeah, right. Well, then, uh, have a seat. I asked Monica to come here today because, well, she's a lot of fun, but also because today she's got something to tell us. Yeah, great news, guys. I'm going to have a baby. No, you're not. Pardon me? You're not going to have a baby. That's funny. I was sure I was. Why don't you think Monica's going to have a baby, Joy? Because when my mom was going to have a baby, she had a really big tummy. Oh, I see. You don't think my tummy's big enough to have a baby inside, right? Yes. Well, I think I can explain, but um, could I have an apple first? An apple? Uh, yeah, sure. Joy, do you know how a baby begins? No. <laughs> well, it's really cool. A baby begins as a special cell that's made by a mom and a dad, and it lives inside the mother's body. And it's really little, just like that freckle on your nose. And that's how you began, as a special tiny little cell inside your mother's body. What happens to it? Well, Christopher, it begins to grow. It becomes two cells and then four cells, and pretty soon, well, here, let me show you. I went to my doctor today, and he gave me these really neat pictures. See, after a few weeks, that tiny cell grows into this. That's an embryo. And that's what's inside of me right now, Joy, an embryo. And I haven't gotten big yet because the embryo is still really small. See, it's only about as big as my thumb, and it's right here inside me. And it keeps growing and getting bigger and bigger every day. Will you get a big tummy? Don't worry, I'll get enormous. Oh, Monica, here's your apple. Thanks. Um, could I have some peanut butter on that? Peanut butter on the apple. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, buddy. So, anyway, this embryo, it begins to grow. And after a while, it looks like this. It looks like a little person. Doesn't it? We can see its itty-bitty feet and hands and head. See, now it's called a fetus. That's spelled F-E-T-U-S. Fetus. And that's what we call a baby before it comes out of its mother. How does the fetus get food? Oh, it just orders out for pizza. Huh. No, I don't. Okay, okay, you're right. It doesn't order out for pizza. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even eat with its mouth yet. See, the fetus has a very special way of eating. How is that? Well, this may sound a little strange, Joy, but uh, do you have a belly button? <laughs> yes. Well, that's how a fetus gets its food, right through its belly button. <laughs> no, it's true. Here, look, I have another picture to show you. See, there's a tube that comes from the mother and goes right into the belly button of the fetus. And through that tube goes all the food and oxygen that the fetus needs to grow. That's why I've been so hungry these days, you see, because I'm not just eating for myself. I'm also eating for the baby because everything I eat goes through the tube to the baby so it can keep growing. Well, Monica, here is your apple and peanut butter. Great. You know, I would really love a pickle. A pickle with the peanut butter and apple. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> How long does the fetus stay inside you? Well, from the time that special cell begins to grow to the day the baby is born is about nine months. But then, when the fetus is big enough and strong enough, it comes out. Ta-da! The baby's born! Oh, gosh. Listen, guys, I'm sorry. I have to go. My husband and I decided that we would go swimming every day so that I could stay healthy for the baby. But I'll see you guys again real soon, okay? Bye, Bye. Monica. Bye. Okay, Monica, here's your pick. Coles. She left? Uh, yeah. what, what did I miss? Sit down. I'll tell you. You begin as a special cell. It's made by your mom and your dad. And it lives inside of your mother's body. The cell grows and grows and becomes an embryo. And then a fetus with tiny feet and hands. In nine months, you're born. Every part of you is very small, except for your voice. And that's how human life begins. But what happens then? Can a baby take care of itself after it's born? Well, not really. Babies actually need a lot of help. And you might know this if you've ever watched animal babies after they're born. You were 
brand new And you're pretty helpless too Not too much that you can do Cause you're the baby Oh, you can babble, you can coo People tell you, could you coo? Why do they act the way they do? Cause you're the baby In the middle of the night No one gets up tight When you tell them with no ifs, ands, buts, or maybes you're not crying to be rude, but you really want some food. That's the way it goes when you're the baby. So if you babble, bay, or bark, and if you're frightened of the dark, just remember this remark, and someday maybe you might be a proud mom or dad. It might be hard, but you'll be glad. So don't forget the fun you had. Just cause you're the baby. Bob, we have a baby at our house now. Oh, that's neat. Is it a baby boy or a baby girl? It's a girl and its name is Laura. Do you help take care of Laura? Mm-hmm. Everybody does. Laura sits in a swing, and Mom straps her in so she won't fall out. All of her toys are soft so she won't get hurt when she plays with him. Laura. Laura. Okay, honey, I think it's time to feed the baby now. May I help? Certainly. She's so cute. Laura needs a lot of food and a lot of love. Today we're going to Grandma's house. When Laura rides in the car, she needs a lot of protection. She's so little, she can't do much yet, but soon she'll be old enough to ride bikes and play with me. And I can't wait. And I'm sure you're going to have a great time with your little sister Laura as soon as she learns how to take care of herself, right Joy? Right. Yeah. We all have families, and we would like to show you what our families look like. We've made some drawings. Would you like to see them? Joy, why don't you go first and show us your picture? Okay. This is my dad, my mom, my baby sister, Laura, my brother, Arnell, and me. That's great. Sarah, what's your family look like? My mom and dad and me and Mary Ellen and Zach and Peter and Kate. <laughs> Pretty big family. Christopher, what's yours like? My mom, me, and my dog Ralph. Ralph looks pretty big there. <laughs> and this is my family. My parents, I've got two sisters, a brother, and me. I'm the tallest. I think I'm also the best looking, don't you? No. no. Well, all right. Why don't we pin out our drawings up on the fridge? Okay, that's okay. a good idea. Why don't you guys go do that? And so we've seen how a baby begins how a very tiny but very special cell inside the mother's body becomes an embryo. Then it grows into a fetus. And about nine months later, the baby's born right out of the mother's body. And Joy showed us how a newborn baby needs to be protected and cared for. I'm sure there's someone who protects and cares for you, too. Well, I think it's time to put my picture up on the refrigerator. You know, guys, I still think that I'm the best-looking member of my family, you know, don't you? Don't you think? No? Well, all right. Well, I'm going to put it <laughs> right there. And so, our program on beginnings has finally reached... The end! The end. When you get up in the morning and look in 
the mirror you see your eyes, mouth, teeth, hair, ears and nose Your muscles and bones give you a real good place for you to wear your clothes You've got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart And what we think and feel is a very important part Of how we're put together, why we do what we do Why I look like me and you look like you It's a bunch of neat stuff, it's fun to know Watch, listen and learn with head to toe The kids are busy making some kind of big picture. It's not just a picture, it's a mosaic. A mosaic? What's that? It's when you use a lot of little things to make one big thing. See, we're using little pieces of paper. Oh, I get it. So you guys are putting together these little tiny pieces of paper. And when it's done, you get one gigantic picture. Oh, so what's it a picture of? We're not telling. Oh, come on. Go away. Oh, oh. Go okay. Away. okay, okay, okay. I won't look. I won't look. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Bones. Nice outfit. <laughs> hmm. A lot of little tiny pieces that add up to one big thing. You know, I like that idea. And you know that you are made of many tiny pieces that add up to one big thing? Uh, now, they're not pieces of paper like this, because if they were, <laughs> every time it rains, you'd fall apart. No, you're made of very tiny pieces that you can't actually see with your eye. And your body has, oh, billions and billions of them. What are they? They're called cells. Now, not only do you have cells, but plants and animals have them too. Let me show you what I mean. I've got some leaves here that uh, I just pulled off some plants that were growing outside. Hello, bird. Hi, Bob. Now, these leaves have cells in them, but we can't see them right now because they're too small. We can't see them just with our eyes. But if you want to see things that are very tiny, you use one of these things. It's called a microscope. And it's an instrument that helps you th see things that are very, very small. And all you need to do is just put something like a leaf on the microscope. And then we look through this eyepiece. It's sort of like a camera. I turn the knob until it's focused. And whoa, look at that. Doesn't look like a leaf anymore. Can you see all those little sections? They kind of look like rooms in an apartment building. Well, those are the cells. And each one of those is one cell. Now, I'm just going to change the magnification here so that we can get a closer look. Oh, yeah. Now we can see that each cell has a little bit of structure. It has what looks like a wall around the outside, and then there's a dark spot in the middle. Now, you know, if you were to take any part of your body and put it underneath this microscope, you would also see that you are made of cells. Here's a picture of some cells from skin. Can you see the little sections again? And here's a picture of some blood cells. Now, they have a slightly different shape, but they're still cells. Here are some cells from a strand of hair. And here are some bone cells. So we could look at lots of different things under the microscope, and we still see cells. We might look at the cells that are in an apple, or maybe those that are in a slice of mushroom, or even some seeds. The cells might have different shapes and different colors, but we'd see cells because everything that's alive is made of cells. Here's a forest, a green, green forest What makes a forest everybody sees Here's a tree, a green, green tree What makes a tree everyone agrees Here's a leaf, a green, green leaf What makes a leaf everybody yells Here's a cell, a tiny, tiny cell what makes a cell? Everybody shout. Let's find out what cells are all about. Let's go see why cells are important to you and me. Let's find out what cells are all about. Cells are important to you and me. What makes a cell? Everybody shout. 
What makes a cell? Well, let's have a look. These are some models of what cells look like. Now, these models are a lot bigger than real cells, but they let us see what they're like on the inside. So imagine that we just made ourselves really, really tiny so that we could pick up a cell and hold it in our hand. It'd probably be something like this. Now, cells have many different parts, and there's a lot going on inside them. On the outside is a skin that's sort of like the outside of this balloon, and that just holds everything together. On the inside is a liquid. So, if you could actually hold a cell in your hand, it would probably be kind of squishy like this. Now, if we were to cut this balloon in half and see the inside of the cell, it would look like this one over here. So, here we have the outside, the skin, then there's liquid on the inside, and in the center is the most important part. That's called the nucleus, and every cell has a nucleus. Now, if we were to take the nucleus apart and go inside it, we'd find something that looks like this. It's sort of stringy material that bleh, <laughs> looks a lot like spaghetti. And the spaghetti-like material is made of something called genes. You ever heard of that word, genes? I wonder if the kids have. Hey, everybody. Have you ever heard the word genes? Bob, I wear jeans all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I like wearing jeans, too. And this is a different kind. These genes are even spelled differently. G E N E S genes. Now, what's so important about the genes that are inside the stringy material that's inside the nucleus of all the cells that make up your body? Well, to find that out, let's go back and have another look at the mosaic. Hey guys, picture's looking great. Don't look good at it. Okay, 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 I won't look. Listen, I just have a question for you. How do you know where to put all those little pieces of paper? I mean, how do you know what colors to use and, and what shapes to make to get the picture? We have a plan. A plan? Yeah, on this drawing. Oh, can I see that? No, no, Bob, then you'll know what it looks like. Okay, I promise I won't look at it. Well, the important thing is they have a plan. And a plan means that they already know what colors to use and what the shapes are going to look like. Just wish they'd tell me about it. You know, this may sound funny, but your cells have a plan for what you look like. Inside each of your cells is a plan, a set of directions, that determine what color your eyes are, what color your hair is, how tall you are, even what shape you have. And these directions are in the genes of your cells. Remember the genes? Here's a real cell. Inside of those genes is the plan that tells your body how to grow. Now, watch this the cell is starting to stretch. In a moment, it's going to split. That's how you grow. Cells divide, creating more and more cells. Now, look at these three cells. They all look the same, don't they? But each one of them has a different set of genes, so they'll grow into three different types of living things. Can you guess what they're going to grow into? Cells grow by dividing and then dividing again and again, adding more and more cells. But still, it's hard to guess what these cells are going to become. Ah, the cells are now starting to form babies. But they still look pretty much the same. Now, can you tell what they are? Each one is closer to being born, and each one is starting to look very different. One has a small beak. That looks like a bird. Another one has small hands and feet. It's going to grow into a human baby. And the third has ears and tail. That's going to become a kitten. In a few weeks, they'll all be born or hatched, and then they'll be very different from each other. But they all began the same way, as a single cell. They grew into different living things because each cell had different genes, a different plan for what the cell would become. It's coming along. Every person in the world has their own special set of genes, their own special plan for who they are. And you can tell this if you just look around at all your friends. They're different, aren't they? 
Some are tall, some are short, some have red hair, some have dark skin. Everyone is very different because everyone has a different set of genes. You know, it's kind of funny. In many ways, all human beings are the same. I mean, we all breathe in air through our lungs. We all use our senses. Our noses are in the middle of our face. We have two eyes, two ears, 10 fingers and toes, and so many other things that are the same. But in other ways, we're all very different. And I guess that's good because it would be pretty boring if we were all exactly the same. So it's good that we have different genes. It makes the world a much more interesting place. Every living thing is made up of cells. A cell has several parts. In the middle is the nucleus. And in the nucleus are genes. Genes are the plan for how a living thing will grow. What kind of animal it will be, what color it will be, what shape it will be. Cells divide, that's how you grow. Every person in the world has their own special genes. Well, is this thing finished? Can I look at it now? Yeah! Hmm. Well, it's interesting, but is this the way you wanted it to turn out? Yeah, yeah. see? Here's the plan. The plan. Wow, yeah, you're right. Look, there's, there's the tree and the fence and the grass. Wait, so you already knew what this was going to look like before you even started? Yeah! yeah. Wow. Do you like it? Um, no. Get out! I love it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just little pieces of paper. Yeah, I like about a million of them. Yeah, it sure is. It's amazing how, how something so wonderful can be made of just little tiny pieces. And now we know something else that's wonderful that's made up of a lot of little tiny things. You! you. When you get up in the morning and look in the mirror You see your eyes, mouth, teeth, hair, ears and nose Your muscles and bones give you a real good place For you to wear your clothes You've got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart And what we think and feel is a very important part Of how we're put together, why we do what we do Why I look like me and you look like you It's a bunch of neat stuff It's fun to know Watch, listen and learn with Bob says, give me a stupid smile. <laughs> yeah. Bob says, put both your fingers on your nose. Okay. Bob says, cross your eyes. Can you do that? <laughs> Bob says, make a funny face. <laughs> Hi. We're playing a game of Bob Says. It's my favorite game. That's because I'm Bob. Okay. Bob says, move your fingers like spiders. Big daddy long leg spiders. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, Bob says, don't move anything. That's easy. Ah, uh, yeah, but don't move anything outside or inside your body. Don't blink. Don't breathe. Don't move anything. I feel something moving. Where do you feel something moving? Right here. Can you make it stop? I don't think so. Hmm, isn't that interesting? 
There's something beating inside you and you don't even think about it. Well, that's your heart and it's a pretty amazing muscle. Okay, one more. Bob says, try to feel your heartbeat. Do that. Put your hand on your chest like this. Hold really still. Beat, beat, beat. Can you feel it? Mine's going beep, beep. Beep, 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 beep. Can you feel your heart beating inside your chest? Beep, 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 beep. Okay, how many times do you think your heart beats like that every hour? What do you think, Diego? A hundred. A hundred times an hour? What do you think, Joy? Two hundred. Two hundred? What do you think, Christopher? I think a thousand. A thousand times? That's quite a lot. Would you believe that your heart beats almost four thousand times every hour? Four thousand times, and it never stops. And that's what we're going to talk about, is your heart, how it beats and what it does inside your body. And I want to show you something really neat. It's over here. Let's go. Your heart is really like a pump. Now, does anybody know what this red thing is? When you move the handle, water comes out. That's right, Christopher. This is a water pump. And we can see some of the parts of it here. Down below, there's a jar, and it's got some water inside. We colored it blue so that you can see it a little better. And coming out of the jar is a tube and the tube goes up into the pump, and then we have a big bucket over here. Now, suppose we want to move the water from the jar to the bucket. Is it going to move by itself? No. No, of course not. We need a pump, right? Who wants to work the pump? I do. Okay, okay. The handle's nice and big, so why don't all three of you try it? Okay, go ahead. Just pump. Let's see what happens. Now the water's coming up the tube, and whoa, pumping up the pump. <laughs> Isn't that a great pump? Your heart really is like that water pump because it pumps something through your body. But what is that something? Is it water like the pump? Is it air like this air pump? Or is it blood? Well, your heart pumps blood. Have you ever thought about your blood? I thought about it yesterday when I cut my finger. All this blood came out. I had to put a Band-Aid on it. But why would my heart be pumping blood all the way from my chest, down my arm, and up to my finger? Well, blood feeds my finger. Blood takes the good stuff out of the food you eat and the air that you breathe, and it feeds your fingers, your muscles, your brain, all of your body. You ever seen what your heart looks like? Well, it doesn't look like this. That's a valentine. Here's what your real heart looks like. I have one over here. Your heart looks something like that. It's not very big. It's only about the size of your fist, and it sits in your chest right about here, and it beats. Beep, 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 beep. And you know what's strange about it is that it's hollow inside. Now, I have another one here that's a little bigger so that you can see it. Come on in close so you can see what it looks like. And we can open the sides of it and look inside, and you can see that it's hollow in there, and that's where the blood goes. So the blood comes in some of these tubes. It fills up the inside of the heart, and then because the heart's a muscle, it can squeeze. So it squeezes tight, and then all the blood comes gushing out again. And then the heart relaxes, and some more blood goes in, and then it squeezes it again and forces the blood out. And every time the heart does that, when it squeezes, that's a beat. That's what you feel. And it goes, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Now these tubes that come out of the top of the heart, they go through your body, and they go everywhere. Your heart is in the middle of your chest, protected by your rib cage. When your heart beats, it's pumping blood through hollow tubes. The tubes divide and branch out, carrying blood to every part of your body. Other tubes bring the blood back to the heart, and the heart pumps it out all over again. Hi, guys. Hi. Okay, you want to do a little experiment? Sure. Yeah? Okay, this is something that you can try, too. I want you to count your heartbeats using a tube that's in your neck. Okay? And the way you do that is that you take two fingers like this. Okay? And you can do this, too. Put them on your neck, just underneath your chin, like that. A little I bit found ahead. it. Yeah, you got it? There's I a sauce. Up. No, you want to be a little farther forward than that. Just I got there. it. Yeah? Good. Can you feel it? Feel I your heartbeat? It. That's right. You feel your beat? Yeah. That's the blood going from your heart up into your head. So you can count your heartbeats by counting those little pulses that you feel right here. So I want you to count. Every time you feel a beat, I want you to count it and start when I say go and keep counting until I say stop, okay? And you can do this too. Ready? Go. Are you counting?
counting. Count the beats in your neck. And stop. Okay, does everybody have a number? Yeah. Yeah, yes. you got a number of beats to count. I want you to take that number that you that you just counted and write it on the board over there beside your name underneath sitting. Okay, go. Okay. Write it down. How many did you get, Christopher? Ten. Good. How many did you get, Diego? Eleven. Eleven. I got thirteen, the highest number. Yeah, yours was the highest. Okay, that was how many heartbeats you had just by sitting. Well, now, I want you to do something silly. I want you to stand up, and I want you to get silly, and you do this too. Get up, stand up, and start jumping. Start jumping up and down and jump around and put your hands over your head. Get really silly. Jump around. Yeah, yeah, hands yeah, up high. I'm Keep really jumping around. Really Use good. all this energy. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're working really hard. Oh, good. Okay, now come on. Sit down. Now I want you to do it again. Okay, find your spot. Find your tube in your neck. Okay, and start counting. Go. Count the beats. Count the beats. Are you counting? And just a few more. And stop. Okay, does everybody have a different number now? Yeah? Yes. Okay, now I want you to take that number and write it on the board underneath jumping. Go ahead. Okay. How many did you get, Christopher? 21. 21. That's almost, well, that's more than twice as many as you had before, right? Okay. Joy, how many did you get? 19. 19, yeah. And Diego, how many did you have? 17. 17. So all your numbers were higher when you were jumping around than when you were just sitting still. Why do you think that your heart is beating faster when you were jumping around? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, when your muscles are working hard, when you're jumping or when you're exercising, they need extra food and extra oxygen. So your brain tells your heart to beat faster so it can get that extra food and oxygen to your muscles so that they can get the job done. Right? Yes, Joy? Can I tell you something? Sure. I got to hear a heartbeat once. You got to hear a heartbeat? Where? At the doctor's. Remember when my mom was going to have a baby? Most times I didn't get to go with her to the doctor, but one time she wanted me to come along. Joy, your mom's ready to see you now. All right. Hi, Mom. Hi, sweetheart. Come a little closer. There's somebody I want you to meet. Joy, will you please hold this while I listen for the baby? Is that your heart beating? No, that's the baby's heart. It sounds like a little drum. Okay, honey, it's time to go now. Thank you, Doctor. My pleasure. We hear you, little sister, loud and clear. And then I had to leave. Well, what did the baby's heart sound like? Ba -bump, ba -bump, ba -bump. Wow, really fast. So, your heart starts beating even before you're born. And it'll keep beating every day for year after year if you take care of it. Christopher and Diego want to show us that there are some things that are very good for your heart and some things that are very bad for your heart. Let's watch. Hi, heart. Hello, heart. You don't look too good. I don't feel too good. We need to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. What's wrong? My owner only eats fried food, like fried chicken and french fries. No way! My owner doesn't get any exercise. He just sits down and watches TV all day. No way! And my owner stays around people who smoke cigarettes. So he's always breathing in their smoke. Stop it. You're breaking my heart. Your owner has to take better care of you or you'll get sick. Do you mean it? Cross my heart. You need to get lots of exercise and plenty of healthy food. And stay away from cigarette smoke. Come on, screw ride bikes. Good idea. Hey, how do you know all about being healthy? Easy. I learned it by heart. Hey. And thank you, Christopher and Diego, for that heartwarming story. <laughs> Pretty funny stuff, eh, Joy? Yes. <laughs> but what they said is true. Your heart is a muscle. 
and just like all the other muscles in your body, it needs exercise. So when you do things like ride your bike or play games or even just go for a long walk, you're giving your heart the exercise that it needs to stay strong. When you play a game of kickball When you have a busy day When you take a hike or take off on your bike Your hustle helps the muscle that is pumping away The beat goes on And the blood keeps flowing And your heart keeps going Bump, 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 bump The beat goes on And your body keeps growing And your heart keeps pumping And the beat goes on Your heart is a pump. It's a very powerful muscle that pumps blood. The blood carries food and oxygen to your muscles, skin, brain, and other organs. To keep your heart healthy, eat good food. Don't stay in places where there's a lot of cigarette smoke. And get lots and lots of exercise. Okay, Bob says, freeze. Don't move. By the way, during this program, your heart beat about 1,000 times. Okay, Bob says, pump the pump, really hard. This arm up, yeah, 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 yeah. This arm up, la 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 la, da da da. This leg up, la 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 la. What? What happened to your strings? <laughs> I don't have any strings. You don't have any strings? Then how do you move? How do you lift your arms up or lift your leg up? I just do it. <gasps> wow, that is amazing. How'd you do that? Well, most people just move whenever they want. Whenever they want? That is amazing. <laughs> yes, it is amazing how we can move without using strings like little Larry here. But how do we move? Well, maybe Mr. Bones can give us a clue. Right? Oh. Hi, Mr. Bones. Hi, Mr. Bones. Nice hat. 
Chow, do you know how many bones we have in our body? A mm, hundred. A hundred? That's a good guess. And that's a lot. Would you believe we have twice as many as that? Two hundred bones in our body. That's a lot. That is a lot. And bones do a lot. I mean, they give us support so that we don't fall down into a big blob of skin. They give us our shape so that we look like people. And because they're hard, they protect us. But there's one thing that bones cannot do. Not by themselves. They can't move. They need something to help them move. Just like Larry the marionette needed strings so he could move his arms and a leg, our bones need something so that we can do things like raise an arm. Can you raise Mr. Bones' arm? Yeah, the bones need help to do that. Or to raise a leg. Can you raise his leg? Yeah. Even to move our jaw so that we can talk. All right, how's it going? <laughs> Chow, do you know what it is that our bones need to move? Muscles. Muscles, right. It's our muscles that keep us on the move. Can you move your muscles and move your bones? Yeah, move everything you got here. Lots of bones, lots of muscles. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of bones, lots of muscles. If we could see our muscles, they'd look like this. You have muscles in every part of your body. How many muscles do you have? What would you guess? You have about 600 muscles. 600, and they do the work of helping you move. Hey, and, Bob, what's oh, happening? Hi, guys. Well, we're talking about muscles. And sometimes you can feel muscles, especially when they're working hard. Now, here's something that we can try, and you can try, too. Put your hands on your cheeks like this. Okay? You feel anything? What's it feel like? Soft. Soft. Is anything moving? No. No. Okay, now try this. Open your jaw really wide. Huh? Now close it tight. Squeeze your teeth. Now open and close and open and close. What do you feel now? What's it feel like when you do that? It's like my face gets hard and then soft. That's right, child. Those are your jaw muscles moving your jaw. And that happens every time you eat or every time you talk. Okay, here are some other muscles that you can feel. Hold your hand out like this, palm up, and try this. Now, just open and close your fingers. Really hard, okay? Now, with your other hand, feel along your arm. Do you feel anything? The muscles in my arm are going crazy. Yeah, all along your arm. You feel all those little tiny muscles in there that are moving your fingers, moving the bones of your hand. Okay, one more. Take your arm, move it up and down like this. Now, with your other hand, feel along your arm, do you feel any muscle that might be doing that? I feel one big one right here. And what's it doing? It gets the big when my arm comes up and it gets small when my arm goes down. That's right. That's the big muscle that moves your arm up here. When you want to move your arm, your brain says to, to this muscle right here, it says squeeze, and the muscle squeezes and shortens, and that pulls the bones in your arm, so your arm bends. Then when the muscle relaxes, your arm can come back down again. And actually, there's another muscle. Can you feel on the underside of your arm, right under here? There's another muscle, and this muscle is what you use when you push your arm out like that. It causes your arm to straighten. So this one pulls to straighten your arm, and this one up here squeezes to bring your arm back up. You know, there's another place where you can see lots of muscles in action, and that's when you watch animals. Let's see. Animals are moving all the time. And if you watch them closely, you can really see their muscles working. Look at these horses, so strong and fast. See the muscles in their hind legs getting tight and then relaxing over and over again so the legs can move? You can really see her muscles rippling as she runs. Even when animals are playing, their muscles work hard. But animals use their muscles for more than just running and jumping. Any movement, no matter how tiny, involves muscles. And Naomi is going to show how some of our tiny muscles work. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Come on in and have a close look at Naomi. No, I mean really close. Now, Naomi, look up. Look down. Look to one side. Look to the other side. Squeeze your eyes shut. Open. <laughs> Blink. Blink. All of that motion just from our eyes. Some of our muscles are moving all the time and we don't even know it. Now your eyes can move because they have muscles. This is a model of what your eye looks like on the inside and the red things down the sides and along the top are the muscles that let your eyes move around. Big, small, fast, slow. If any part of you moves, it has muscles. If it moves, if it grabs and growls and grooves, 
If it pops and howls and hustles, it has muscles. If it talks, if it wades and wiggles and walks, if it nods and nudges and nuzzles, it has muscles. If it snakes, if it shuffles and shivers and shakes, if it runs and rises and rustles, if it slithers, if it shakes and quicks and quivers, if it creeps at all and makes your skin crawl, if it moves, if it grabs and growls and grooves, if it hops and howls and hustles, it has muscles. <clears throat> muscles. If it moves, if it grabs and growls and grooves, if it hops and howls and hustles, you guessed it, it has muscles. If it's alive and uses corpuscles, if it rustles and hustles and nudges and muscles, it has muscles. Right now, your 600 muscles are just the right size for you. They're kid size. But those muscles are going to have to grow as you grow. Now, like the rest of your body, muscles need good food to grow. But muscles also need something else, something very important to stay strong and healthy. Muscles need exercise. If you don't use them, you lose them. So let's look at some things that you might do after coming home from school. Let's see which ones are the best for your muscles. Action. Come on, Christopher, ride bikes with me. No, thanks. I'm busy. You don't look busy. I'm watching TV. Oh, come on. We could ride all the way down to the river. I'm busy. OK, bye. Watching television or riding bikes? Which is the best exercise for your muscles? Sleeping, reading, or playing catch. Which one is more active? Which one is best for your muscles? You win. Phew, that was good exercise. I know, I'm tired. Yeah, me too. You're tired? You didn't do anything. Hey, watching is hard work, okay? Yeah, right, sure. <laughs> Playing sports or watching sports? What's best for your muscles? Bravo, bravo, bravo. Okay, have a seat and take a little rest. So, what are the right choices? Riding bikes. Throwing a ball. Playing and not watching. Right. And that's because those things are all active. They get you and your body moving and working, and that's what your muscles need every day. Hmm. I wonder, what other things do you guys do to keep your muscles exercised? Chow? Well, I like to dance. You do? Uh-huh. At home, we turn on the radio and we all dance. That's great. Dancing's wonderful exercise. It's also lots of fun. I'm taking swimming lessons. You are? What are you learning? Mm, freestyle and the backstroke. Oh, and next week we learn how to dive. Wow. How do you feel after you've been swimming? Really tired, but really happy. Oh. What do you do, Bob? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I like to ride my bicycle and I like to go sailing. What about you, Christopher, my man? What do you do to exercise your muscles? Well, I like baseball and basketball. But right now my favorite is soccer. It's a great sport, isn't it? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Christopher also had a chance to meet some people who use their muscles in a very special way. Right, Chris? Right. Let's watch. Hi, Leah. Hi, Mrs. French. Hi, Hi Christopher. Christopher. How did you get started on the flying trapeze? 
Bernadette has a little trapeze on the ground. And she tells you how to swing and, and you go up and try it. And she tells you when to let go of the bar to lay on the net on your back instead of your feet or your head. Does it hurt when you hit the net? No, it's exhilarating. You just fall down to the net, it feels wonderful. What muscles do you use the most? Arms climbing the ladder. That's the hardest part is climbing the mast and your, you know, your biceps are used a lot. What kind of food do you eat to keep you healthy? Apples, potatoes, potatoes spaghetti, salad, salad, cereal. I drink a lot of milk. Well, we can't all be high flyers like Leah, but we can all get some exercise and eat healthy food to keep our muscles strong and healthy. Wow, well, Christopher, that looked like a lot of fun. Do you think you'd uh, like to get up there on the trapeze and fly like that? No way! It looked like a lot of fun, but it was too high for me. Though it did look fun bouncing on the net. Ah, I see. Like Christopher said, not everybody can be a high flyer, but there are things that we can do every day to exercise. Chow likes to dance, Naomi likes to swim, and Christopher likes to play soccer. Now, are you guys doing those things every day because you know they're good for your muscles? Yeah. Uh, do you do all of those things because you know your muscles need the exercise every day to grow healthy and strong? Well, then why do you do those things? Because they're fun! <laughs> Right, because they're fun, of course, and that's the great thing about exercise. It's a lot of fun. Not only is it good for our muscles, but it's neat to do and it makes us feel good. What do you do for exercise? You move because you have muscles. 600 muscles, large and small, move your legs, your arms, your hands, your eyes, every part of your body. Muscles need exercise to grow strong and stay healthy. Do, 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 do. I'm a dog and you're not. <laughs> Hi, kid. <gasps> what? Oh, no. You don't have a big hand. What big hand? You know, a big hand inside you that helps you move. Here we go again. Let me explain this to you. See, people have muscles inside. A real good place for you to wear your clothes you got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart and what we think and feel is a very important part of how we put together why we do what we do why i look like me and you look like you it's a bunch of neat stuff it's fun to know watch listen and learn with head to toe One, two, three, hi! One, two, three, go! Da 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 Swing the other way! Da 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 One, two, three, go! Ha! Whee! Who turned off the lights? <laughs> we were just playing around with our umbrellas. It was kind of rainy today and everybody brought them in so we were just having a little fun. Okay everybody, time to put your umbrellas back in the closet. Do you know that you are like an umbrella? I mean, you you don't look like an umbrella, but, uh, well, here's what I mean. An umbrella is just a, a round piece of cloth that's kind of loose and floppy, and it gets its shape because on the inside there are some stiff wires, and these wires stretch the cloth out and give the umbrella its umbrella shape. Well, you're the same way. You have soft skin on the outside of your body that covers you all over, and on the inside you have bones. Now, you can feel a bone just like this. Hold your arm up 
and squeeze your arm and just feel around here, especially underneath your wrist. Can you feel something hard in there? That hard thing is a bone. And it's like the wires in the umbrella. It's stiff and it's hard and it gives you some shape. Now, how many of these bones do you think you have in your body? 50? 87? 100? More than 200? Did any of you guess more than 200? Well, if you did, you're right. Now, it's hard to imagine that we have that many bones inside our body. I'd like you to meet someone who can show us just how many bones we really do have. This is Mr. Bones. Hi, Mr. Bones. Nice hat. You ever seen one of these? It's called a skeleton. And a skeleton is a collection of all the bones of an animal or a person who've been put together so that you can see what they look like. Now, this skeleton isn't real. It's just made of plastic. But it shows you all of the bones that make up the human body. Now, were you already guessing that this was the skeleton of a human body before I told you that? I mean, look at it. Does it sort of look like a human? There's a head at the top. There are some shoulders. There's two arms with hands, two legs. So a skeleton has the same shape that I do. And that's one of the things that a skeleton does. It gives you your shape. Now, here's another skeleton that has a different kind of shape. Where do you think this skeleton came from? It doesn't look like a human person. So what do you think it is? Well, let's look at it. It has four legs. See? One, two, three, four. On the ends of the toes are some sharp claws. There's a head over here at this end that has some long teeth on it. And the back is kind of curved. And then there's a long tail over here. What do you think this skeleton is from? Well, this is from a cat. Kind of looks like a cat, doesn't it? You know, you pet a cat and their back arches up like that. It's about the size of a cat. So a skeleton gives you a shape. I'd like you to meet someone else. Now, this is a very unusual skeleton. Kind of looks like a paper plate. <laughs> Actually, it is a paper plate. And underneath the paper plate is a friend of mine. I'd like you to meet Gertrude the guinea pig. Hi, Gertrude. Come on out. Come on out and say hi to everybody. She likes to be scratched right behind the ears, just like this, don't you? All right. Can you see how tiny her feet are? Yeah, and she's talking to us, too. Look at her little tiny claws and little tiny feet. There, she's pointing them out to us. Gertrude is a small animal. So what do you think her skeleton would look like? Well, I have a guinea pig skeleton here. Here, Gertrude, you just sit right there. That's a good girl. And you can watch. Here is a guinea pig's head. And look at the shape of the skeleton head compared to Gertrude's head. Yeah, you agree, don't you? You see how it has the same shape? And look at the front. There's some really strange curved teeth here at the front and some more teeth underneath. And that's one of the nice things about looking at skeletons. You can see what an animal looks like on the inside. You can't tell what Gertrude's teeth look like just by looking at her on the outside like this, can we? Yeah. <laughs> Here's some other bones from a guinea pig. Little tiny. They're not very big. And they're really light. They hardly weigh anything at all. And that's because Gertrude doesn't weigh very much either. Hey, what do you think of Hi, these? Bob. What you doing? Well, hi, Sam. I'm just playing with Gertrude, the guinea pig. <laughs> Would you like to meet her? Hi, Gertrude. Yeah, she likes to be petted. And I'm looking at Gertrude's skeleton, or a guinea pig skeleton. And they're really tiny bones, aren't they? They don't weigh very much. Can you imagine an animal that has a really large skeleton? Once I saw a skeleton as big as a car. As big as a car? You're kidding. No, I'm not. Where did you see a skeleton as big as a car? I'll tell you. Out with Jody to the museum. She wanted to see the turtles. She really likes turtles. And she has pictures of them in her room and on her book bag. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. I'm just a troll person. <laughs> but before we even got to the turtle room, Casmosaurus! How do you know? Well, the shape of Casmosaurus. See the big head with the pointy things on it? He's so cute. <laughs> also at this museum, they have a place where you can dig for dinosaur bones. Because that's where people find dinosaur bones. In the ground. I found something. Me too. I know what mine is. What? Definitely a football. 
Are you sure? No, I'm definitely just guessing. <laughs> we had so much fun looking at the bones, we forgot to see the turtles. Guess what I have? I'll give you a hint, it's an animal. I'll give you another hint, it's a kind that doesn't have any bones. Give up a worm. Worms are kind of floppy-like, and you can almost tell they don't have any bones. They aren't stiff, and they can't stand up. Do you ever wonder what it would feel like if you didn't have any bones? Well, Mr. Bones can show us all about joints. Let's start with the elbow joint that I had in my arm. Here's his arm, and you can see that there's a really stiff bone up here, a big one. That's the top part of the arm. And there are some really stiff bones down here. That's the bottom part of the arm. And where they join together, that's the joint. That's the part that moves, and that's the part that bends at the elbow so that we can do this. Now, there are lots of other joints in Mr. Bones here. Now, Arnell, what part of your body did you say you could move? A neck. Your neck. Well, look at Mr. Bones' neck. He's got all kinds of bones up here, and where they join, he can move his neck around. And Louisa, what did you move? My hand. Your hand. Can we find his hand? There it is. Sure, and his hand can go up and down like that. How's your hand move? That's right. And that's where some bones come together so that they can move. And Sam, what did you move? I said I could bend my fingers. Let's look at Mr. Bones' fingers. Yeah, see, you move your fingers. And where these bones come together, they move, and those are joints. Even though the bones themselves are very stiff, the joints are where they can bend, and that's so that we can bend. Can you find any other joints in Mr. Bones' body? What other joints? His knees, right. Yeah, look, he's got two knees. Where's your knee? Where's your knee? That's this one down here, right? Big joint right there. What does this part of the body right here remind you of? A cage? A cage, that's right, Arnell. And that's because it is a cage, and we call it the rib cage. All these bones right here. And inside the cage is one of these. You know what this is? What it looks like? You know? It looks like a heart. And the human heart looks something like this, and it's very soft and very delicate, and it could be hurt. So to protect it, it goes inside the cage. So we're going to give Mr. Bones a heart, and your heart sits right about there. And there are some other things in there, like lungs, and they're very soft, and so they're protected by these bones of the rib cage. Can you feel your rib cage? Just feel down your side, just tap it a little bit, and you can feel those hard bones that protect your heart and your other organs. And there's one other part up here at the top. Why do you think we have a hard bone at the top of our head? Because you have, have a brain. brain. We all have brains, right? And brains are very soft, too, and we don't want to hurt them, so they're protected inside the skull. And if you just tap your head just very lightly, you can feel that hard bone that's in there. So our bones also give us protection. I'll get it! <laughs> having a bad day. Hi, Janice. Hi, Bob. Janice, what happened to your arm? I broke it. How? Skating, that's how. Janice, don't you wear a helmet and, and elbow pads and knee pads when you skate? Well, usually I do, but this time I was in a hurry and the sidewalk was wet and I fell real hard and I broke my arm. Did it hurt? A little at first, but now it's okay. Well, that's why we have to think about safety, because even though our bones protect us, we have to protect our bones as well. When you think about your bones, where do you begin? Cause your bones do more than give you a place to hang your skin. They help to keep your insides safe and sound. They help you walk, sit, stand and run. And when you put them all together, what do you have? Your skeleton. Everybody gets a set It's the only set that you get The only thing you need to do Is take care of your bones And they'll take care of you Wanna take care of your bones It's not hard to do Just remember these simple things That we've been showing you we got a question for you before we're done Did you think your bones could be so much fun? And did you ever really think you know this much About your skeleton? They're your bones Everybody gets a set They're your bones It's the only set that you get They're your bones 
the only thing you need to do is Take care of your bones and he'll take care of you Just take care of your bones, they'll take care of you Here are three different drinks. Which one do you think is best for your bones? We have apple juice, we have cola, and we have milk. Which one is best for your bones? Hmm? Answer is, answer milk. is, right, milk. Sure, lots of people tell you that milk's good for you, but they never tell you why. Well, milk is good. Actually, milk is great. And that's because milk helps your bones grow. It makes them strong and keeps them healthy. Actually, there are some other foods that are good for your bones, too. I have some over here in the fridge. Uh, one of them is uh, cheese, and that's because cheese is made from mi milk. And the other one, I have one more here. This is, uh, let's see, it's in here somewhere. Uh, there it is. <laughs> Yogurt. Yogurt's made from milk, too. And it's, hey, what happened to the cheese and milk? Sam, what are you doing down there? I'm just having some bone food. Bone food? Ah, delicious. Well, why don't you just share your bone food with Arnell and Louisa? Come on, you guys. <laughs> Let's have some bone food here and have a little party. Okay, here you are, Louisa. You could have some bone food. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. And here you are. Ah, you have some for your arm there. You need a little extra there. Thank you. You're welcome. Here you are, Arnell. You have some bone food. Thank you. You're welcome. Everybody, eat up. Enjoy your bone food. <laughs> Food is important if you want your bones to be healthy, but there's one more thing that your bones need. They need exercise. So running, jumping, playing, these are all activities that help your bones stay strong and stay healthy. Your bones are strong and stiff. Your bones are all connected. That's called your skeleton. Your skeleton protects you, especially your rib cage and your skull. Exercise is great for your bones, but you also need to protect them sometimes and eat and drink the right foods, like milk and cheese. There, finished. So what did you write, Sam? I wrote, Dear Janice, when I told you give me a break, I didn't mean this. Signed, your arm. Ooh. Oh, oh Sam. Sam. When you get up in the morning and look in the mirror You see your eyes, mouth, teeth, hair, ears and nose Your muscles and bones give you a real good place For you to wear your clothes You've got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart And what we think and feel is a very important part of how Put together why we do what we do Why I look like me And you look like you It's a bunch of neat stuff It's fun to know Watch this and then learn with head to toe That looks like fun, doesn't it? Would any of you like to walk in space? Yeah! You don't really walk, you just float. Boy, I'd sure like to be up there floating around and having fun in space. But I have a question. Why do astronauts have to wear those spacesuits all the time? Does anybody know? I do, because there isn't any air in outer space. Hmm, but why is air so important? Because they have air in their spacesuits, so they can breathe. Oh, so they can breathe. Hmm. Well, that's very interesting. You know, I know of another place where there isn't any air. And when people go there, they have to wear special equipment. They have to wear a special mask so that they can breathe. Any idea where it might be? No. Let's watch and find out. When you go swimming, you know that you can't stay underwater for very long. You have to hold your breath because there's no air to breathe underwater. And people need air to breathe and to live. 
So, if you want to spend a long time underwater, you have to do what these divers do. You have to bring some air with you. They have air in those tanks on their backs. So, when people go underwater, or when they go into space, or even if you're just running around the house, you need air to breathe. And air is kind of mysterious stuff, isn't it? I mean, you, you can't see it, you, you can't feel it. Although, if you do this, just run your, your hand up and down really fast. Can you sort of feel it going through your fingers? You can feel it a little bit. Air is actually real stuff. We can sort of see what air is like. This bag doesn't have anything in it right now, right? Okay, so let's fill it up with air. And we'll get the bag really full of air, and look, now it feels like there's something in there. Can you feel that? Yeah, there it is, feels really squishy. But you can push on it. There's something in it. Air is real stuff. I mean, airplanes fly in it and birds fly in it. And yet, inside the bag, it looks like there's nothing at all. Just air. And we need air to breathe. And you're breathing right now, and so are you. Now, when you do breathe, where does the air go into your body? Your nose. Through your nose? Through my mouth. Your nose. Your mouth. Hmm. We seem to have a little argument here. Your nose, your mouth. I wonder which it is. Let's do a little experiment. Put your hands over your mouth like this, really tight. Okay, now just breathe while you're doing that. Where's the air going? Through my nose. Through your nose. And if you do it really fast, you can actually hear it going in and out. Okay, now try this. Take your finger and put it over your nose like this. Pitch so that you okay, so you now breathe again. Where's the air going this time? Through my mouth. Through your mouth. Hmm. So you're both right. Yeah, you're both right. The air goes into your nose or into your mouth or both. And actually it's a good thing that it can because sometimes when you have a cold, your nose gets all stuffed up and you can't breathe through your nose. So it's a good thing that you can still breathe through your mouth. Well, if you need to breathe the air in through your nose and your mouth, where does it go then? Where does it go inside your body? Want to find out? Everybody up. Let's try this. And you can try this as well. Put your hands on your, on your side. Sort of put them, put them like this, okay? Just feel your chest. Now, take in a really deep breath. You ready? One, two, three, in. Hold it. Do you feel how your chest gets bigger when you do that? Okay, now, let it out. And when you let it out, your chest gets smaller. Okay, breathe in one more time. When you breathe in like this, all the way in, the air goes in through your nose and mouth and into two large bags that are inside your chest called your lungs. Would you like to see how your lungs work? Come on, I'll show you how your lungs actually do that. Uh, but, but. Can we breathe out? Yes. Oh, yes, 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 you can breathe out. You can breathe out now. Okay, don't hold it in like that. Now, let's see how your lungs really work inside your chest. Come on. Now, if you could see inside your chest, that's what your lungs look like, these two pink bags right here. And when you breathe, these bags fill up with air. And the red thing that's in the middle, that's your heart. So your lungs kind of wrap around your heart like that. Now, the way they work is something like, well, it's sort of like this. Naomi, can you blow that balloon up? When you breathe in, your lungs get bigger, like the balloon, because they fill with air, and then let it go. When you breathe out, the air goes out, and your lungs get smaller. So your lungs are just like two balloons that are in your chest, like this, and you have a tube that comes up your throat, and it ends up at your nose and your mouth, and that's where you breathe in and out. Now let's have a closer look. Since this is a model, I can take it apart. So let's take this lung apart. There we are. And we'll take the heart out so that we can see this a little better. There we have our two lungs, and here's the tube that comes down your throat, and then see how it splits here? One goes to one lung, one goes to the other lung, and then it keeps splitting. It splits again here, and then it splits again there, and it keeps going down. And these tubes carry the air to every part of your lungs. And then, see these little tiny spots there? You can just barely see them. The tubes lead to what are called air sacs. And they do just what their name means. They take in and they fill up with air. Let's have a closer look at the air sacs. As it fills up with air, an air sac does a wonderful thing. It takes something out of the air, a special gas, and it puts that special gas into your blood. What is this special gas? Well, first we have to understand that air is actually made up of lots of different things. It's just a swirl of all these different invisible gases, but your body only needs one of them, and that one's called oxygen. 
Now let me spell that for you. I can uh, spell it. You can spell oxygen? That's a, that's a pretty hard word. Give me a break. O-X-Y-G-E-N, oxygen. Whoa, let's hear it for Jody. <laughs> oxygen, that's what your body needs, but it's only one part of the air, so your lungs do a very important job. They take just the oxygen out of the air so that your body can use it. When you breathe in, your air sacs take just the oxygen out of the air and put it into your blood. Your blood takes the oxygen to every part of your body. But something else happens. After your body uses the oxygen, well, you have inside of you a lot of gases that you didn't use. We call that used air. How do we get rid of used air? You breathe out. So, come on, let's get rid of some used air. When you breathe out, your body is getting rid of gases that it just doesn't use. So, it's oxygen in, used air out. Be glad that you breathe out your air It's the tune on the flute and the trumpet Be glad you can blow through your mouth When balloons need to be blown up And be glad you can whistle and sing Every sneeze is a reason for rejoicing Be glad that you breathe out your air With every pump you have the stuff to make excitement So, we know what your lungs like. Pure, clean oxygen. But are there things that your lungs don't like? And how do you know if your lungs don't feel right? Well, you cough. <coughs> Excuse me. Have you ever done that? When you cough, your lungs might be telling you, hey, there's something in the air we just don't like. Now, let me show you some things, and you tell me which of these things would make you cough. Would this make you cough? Probably not. What if you breathed in that smoke? How about this? Would your lungs like this? Do you think you'd be coughing here? What about cigarette smoke? Does that ever make you cough? Smoke makes you cough, doesn't it? And it doesn't matter if it's smoke from burning leaves, a cigarette, or even a smokestack, your lungs just don't like it. And you can probably guess why. Your lungs like oxygen, right? Well, the smoke prevents that oxygen from getting in. So one of the ways to keep your lungs healthy is to just stay away from smoke. But what if you can't stay away from smoke? What if your job takes you near fire? Do you know who I'm talking about? Hi, Mr. Bones. Nice hat. Firefighters are around smoke all the time. So how do you think they prevent that smoke from getting into their lungs? Well, Chow's neighbor is a firefighter, and recently he went to visit her. So how are you doing today, Chow? Fine. That's good. You've come to the firehouse today to find out how firefighters keep their lungs safe in a building fire? Uh-huh. That's a very good question. We have a special piece of equipment called a self-contained breathing apparatus. We call it an SCBA for short. It looks like a scuba diver's tank. That's exactly what it is. But this one you don't use underneath the water. This is for when you're on the ground. We use this to go into building fires because there's so many poisonous gases from the things that are burning in the fire that we can't breathe that air. There's no oxygen in it, so we take our own air in this bottle. There's about 30 minutes of air in here. It, air comes out of the tube and it goes into the mask. Okay, would you like to try it on? Sure. Okay, be careful, it's kind of heavy. Whoa, this is heavy. Okay, let me help you hold it. Okay, first thing you have to do is make sure that it's on. Okay? Then you put the mask over your face and you breathe it in. There's a plastic shield on there so you can see what you're doing. You feel the air? Uh-huh. 
See, this is clean air. It's not the air that you're going to breathe in a house that is burning. This feels funny. <laughs> Let's turn it off. People need air. You breathe through your nose and your mouth. The air goes down an air pipe and into your lungs. When you breathe in, your lungs get bigger. Inside of your lungs are tiny sacs called air sacs. They take the oxygen out of the air and put it into your blood. When you breathe out, you're getting rid of used air. You breathe out when you talk and whistle. Your lungs don't like smoke. Stay away from smoke if you want your lungs to stay healthy. Yeah, nice fresh fruit. Here's one more thing to think about when it comes to your lungs. I'm sure your parents have told you that this is not a toy. Since we've been thinking about our lungs today, I'm sure you can see why this is a dangerous thing to play with. Oxygen does not go through plastic. So if you put this bag over your head, the oxygen cannot get into your lungs. That's why it's dangerous. It's also dangerous to put yourself into a small closed trunk or a closed refrigerator. There just may not be enough oxygen in there for you to breathe. By the way, there's something else we can do with the air that's in our lungs. We can use it to sing. It's Jody's birthday today. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. <gasps> When you get up in the morning and look in the mirror You see your eyes, mouth, teeth, hair, ears and nose Your muscles and bones give you a real good place For you to wear your clothes You've got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart And what we think and feel is a very important part Of how we put together, why we do what we do Why I look like me and you look like you It's a bunch of neat stuff It's fun to know Watch, listen and learn with These are good. Mmm. Ta-da! Who are you supposed to be? I am Sam the Magician, and I will now make something disappear. Watch carefully. Nothing up my sleeves. And abracadabra. It disappeared. I am amazing. That's not magic. Well, then where did it go? Do you know? Do you know where it went? What happens to food after you swallow it? Does it just disappear like magic? Oh, I know where it goes. Food goes down to your stomach. Well, you're right, Arnell. Food does go to your stomach, but how does it get there? And what happens to it after it's in your stomach? I don't know. Well, why don't we find out? Let's think about the amazing trip that food makes when it's inside your body. Come on, I'll show you. Isn't this neat? Yeah. This, this is what it would look like if you could see inside your body. And here are the organs that help you digest food. Uh, hmm. 
there seems to be something missing over here. We don't have a head. And we need a head because that's where the trip that the food takes begins. Who wants to be the head? I will. Okay, Diego, come on back. You can be the head. Good. Now we have a nice head get right in there. So, uh, Diego, uh, how are you doing today? Say you're hungry. I'm hungry. Hungry, huh? Hmm. What's it feel like to be hungry? Um, my stomach is growling and I don't have any energy. And all I can think of is getting some food. Excellent. Isn't it amazing how your body tells you that it needs food? You can actually feel it. Uh, so, Diego, would you like a muffin? Yes, please. Coming right up. Here we are. This is the beginning of a very long trip for this muffin. Now, where does it go? In, in the mouth! In the mouth. Open wide. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're already seeing the first thing that happens to the food. You chew it up. Now, when you chew, your teeth act like knives, and they actually cut the food into little tiny pieces. But there's something else that happens inside your mouth. Your mouth is wet, and that liquid that's in your mouth helps make the food soft. So we'll just add a little bit of liquid here. So your teeth cut it into little pieces, and the liquid in your mouth makes it soft until it looks, well, something like that. And once it looks like this, you're ready to swallow. Have you swallowed your muffin, Diego? Yes. Okay, when you swallow, it goes down your throat. So right now, these little pieces of food go down a tube that's inside your throat, and when you swallow, they go down and down and down until they end up inside, are now what? In your stomach. Right, and there's your stomach right there, and that's where the food goes, but the trip isn't over yet because something else happens inside your stomach. Your stomach also has liquid in it. So we add a little bit more to our muffin. And your stomach can move. And it does something like your teeth. It sort of grinds the food up into even smaller pieces. Mm, like this. So that eventually the muffin doesn't look like a muffin anymore. It looks something like bleh. <laughs> Ooh, Gross. what is that goop? That goop, Yuck. that goop is what's inside your stomach right now. The liquid has made it soft. It's been chewed into very, very tiny pieces. But the trip isn't over yet. There's still one more place that it goes. And that's into your intestines. Yuck. If you could look at your intestine in a microscope, you'd see that it actually has millions of tiny little holes in it. So when the food goes through the tube, some of the food slips out through those holes. So that means that some of the food that you've eaten comes out here, and some of it comes out over here, some over here, slipping out through those millions of tiny little holes. Now here's the amazing part. Once the food goes out through those holes in the intestine, where do you think it goes? Into your blood. Your blood? Uh-huh. The food that you've eaten goes into your blood. So Arnell and Sam, would you like to take these red pens here and show us just where blood goes in your body? Just draw it right on Diego's body there. Your blood goes to your heart, then some to your arms and hands and fingers. Some blood goes down your legs and to your feet. Don't forget my brain. Okay. okay. Here's the blood going to your brain. Your blood goes almost everywhere in your body, and in your blood are those tiny pieces of food. And that's how your body gets its food. When you eat, your teeth mash the food into little pieces, your stomach turns it into a liquid so it can go into your intestine, into your blood, and flow throughout your entire body. And that happens every time you eat. Oranges. Hmm. What if all you ever wanted to eat were oranges. You had oranges for breakfast, oranges for lunch, for a snack you have oranges, oranges for dinner. <laughs> You'd get tired of oranges pretty fast, wouldn't you? And at the same time, your body would not be getting everything it needs to stay healthy. I mean, oranges are good for you, but your body needs different kinds of food so that it can grow, so that you can have energy. Energy to ride your bicycle, run upstairs, and move all the parts of your body. But how do you know which are the right kinds of food to eat? Well, the kids can help us find out. Arnell, Sam, Diego, come over here. Hi, guys. 
Hi, Hi Bob. Bob. We made the basket. For the five food groups. That's great. What's a food group, Sam? It's a lot of different foods that are alike, like milk. That's all the foods that come from milk, like yogurt and cheese and ice cream. Milk are good for your bones and teeth. And vegetables. Vegetables come from plants, like beans and lettuce and carrots. Vegetables are good for your blood and your skin and your eyes. Oh, I see. So by eating different foods, the parts of your body get everything they need to stay healthy. Correct. Ah, well, how many different food groups are there? Five, meat and milk and fruit and vegetables and bread. Bread, huh? Hmm. What's in the bread group, Arnell? Oh, things like bread, of course, and cereal and rice and noodles. Great. Well, you guys did an excellent job. Now, here's what I'd like you to do now. You see all this food I have over here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wonder which types of food go into the different groups. Do you think that you could sort all this food and put them into the different baskets so they're in the right groups? Sure, sure no, no problem. problem. All right, but there's, yeah, well, there's a catch to this. There's a catch to this. Do you think you could do all of that in less than 30 seconds? Hello. Do it. Okay. Are you ready? Go. Chicken meat, peas, vegetable, carrot, vegetable, raisin bread, bread, potato, peas, vegetables, raisin bread, fruit. <laughs> Five seconds. Fish is free. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Congratulations. You finished. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Under 30 seconds. Now, let's see what ended up in each basket. In milk, we have yogurt and ice cream and milk. And in meat, we have chicken, fish, and peanut butter. And in vegetables, we have peas and carrots and lettuce. And in fruit, we have apples, oranges, and bananas and a loaf of raisin bread. And in bread we have crackers and a loaf of raisin bread. Perfect. What's neat is that you can see that there really are five different groups of food. So, if you want to stay healthy, just make sure that you eat food from all five groups every day. And that way you're sure that your body has everything that it needs to be healthy and grow strong. Our friend Chow learned about the five food groups earlier this week. He went to a place where food comes from. He visited a farm. So we grow most everything we eat right here on the farm. You never go to the grocery store? We go to the grocery store sometimes, but most everything we eat is right here on the farm. I don't see the five food groups. I tell you what, you're going to be here on the farm all day. You look and see if you can find the five food groups. I will. We're going to see the first one right in here. Okay, Chow, now we got the cows in. Let's see if you can't find one of the five food groups in here. Which one's that? Milk. Right. How would you like the milk? Sure. Grab a hold of the top and squeeze down. That away. Here. You sit down and milk the cow. This is fun. <laughs> yeah. There you go, now you're getting milk from the cow. We use milk on our cereal. We make butter out of milk. We make cheese out of milk. And ice cream. And ice cream. These look good, chap. Let's see if you can find one. Yeah, these look really pretty. Good, let's go wash them. This is our pumpkin patch chow. We have a few this year, not quite as many as what I'd like, but we have some pretty ones in there. Would you like one? Yeah. Why don't you take this one home? Thanks. Well, you're welcome. Chow, I think there's a nice big pepper down there. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, that's a nice one. Chow, here's some Better Boy tomatoes. Would you like to have some of those for your basket? Sure. They're just really ripe, aren't they? Uh -huh. I never knew tomato plants could get this big. Well, they sure did. Ah, uh, green beans, the vegetable fruit. They sure are. I like to be a farmer. You know why? Why? Because it's just about the best tasting job you can have. <laughs> <laughs> for my next trick, I'll turn this apple into a liquid. And for my next trick, I will turn this carrot into a liquid. And for my next trick, I'm going to turn this sandwich into a liquid. <laughs> what happens to food inside your body isn't magic, but it sure is amazing. And it's good, too, isn't it? Mmm, let's eat. Okay, mm. that's over sandwich. The show started. <laughs> oh, um, hi. Um, uh, where's Bob? Uh, Bob's not here at the moment. Where did he go? Uh, Bob had to go to the bathroom. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, hi, everybody. What's so funny? Uh, Bob, the show started. The show? Oh, hi. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I wasn't here earlier. I uh, uh, well, actually, I was here earlier, but then I had to. Uh, I had to go. Uh... You had to go to the bathroom. Well, thanks for telling everybody, Sarah. You're welcome. Oh well, <laughs> that happens, doesn't it? A couple of times every day, you have to stop whatever you're doing and go to the bathroom. Well, it's nothing to be embarrassed about, really. Everybody does it, and when you go to the bathroom, your body's actually doing something very important. Well, I guess uh, today's a good day to think about why we have to go to the bathroom. And I know a good place to start. Some of you may have seen an earlier program where we talked about what happens when you eat something. I saw that show. Oh, it's great, child. Maybe you saw Diego eating a muffin. How'd you like to tell us and remind us what happens after you do eat something? Sure, that's easy. The first thing you do is chew. Your teeth break food into little pieces, and the liquid in your mouth makes it soft. Then you swallow. The food goes down a long tube to your stomach. Your stomach mashes it and adds liquid, and soon your food is turned into a soupy liquid. It looks like this. Then it goes into another long tube. That's your intestine. It has a lot of tiny holes, and little bits of food go through the holes and into your blood. Thanks, child. That was great. Well, that program told us what happens to food that's inside your body, but it left out one very important thing. What? Come on, I'll show you. 
let's do an experiment to show what happens to food when it's in your intestine. Here's a bowl, and over the top of the bowl, there is a piece of cloth. And can you see how the cloth has some holes in it? Now, those holes are like the holes in your intestine. Now, these holes are a lot bigger than the real holes, but that's just so that we can see it. Now, when the food goes into your intestine, it goes through the holes, and it goes into your blood. Well, let's get some food here. Before it gets to the intestine, it's in your stomach. So here's what used to be a muffin inside our stomach here. And let's suppose you're really hungry. You want to have another one. So, Naomi, do you want to take this muffin and just grind it up there inside the, the stomach? Now, your stomach adds fluids to that food to help break it down. Hello, bird. Hi, Bob. So we'll just add a little bit of fluid here. And then your stomach churns that food around so that it'll break it down even further. So you want to churn up the stomach there. Ah, there it goes and turns our muffin into a nice sloppy goop. Mmm. Okay, now it goes into the intestine. So let's see what happens when it gets to the intestine wall. Naomi, just pour it right on through the cloth there and let's see what happens. Mmm. Yeah. So, what happened? All of it didn't go through. That's right. Look carefully. You can see that in the bottom of the bowl, some of it did go through, and that liquid that does go through goes into your blood, and then that goes through your whole body, and that's how your body gets food. But your body doesn't use all of the food that you eat. And we have a name for that. That's called waste. And because your body doesn't use the waste, it has to get rid of it somehow. That's why we go to the bathroom. That's right, Sarah. That's why we go to the bathroom. Since your body doesn't use all of the food that we eat, it has to get rid of the waste. And to show you just how it does that, let's go to a model. It's just over here. This is a model of what the inside of your body looks like. Say hi to Kathy. Hi, hi Kathy. <laughs> now, this part down here, that's where the food goes after you eat it. It's the soft part of your tummy. Can you feel this part right here? Feel how it's kind of soft down there? Yeah, that's this part here. So after you eat the food, it goes in your mouth, down the throat, and into this kind of baggy looking thing. What do you think that is? A stomach. That's right. That's your stomach, and that's where the food is turned into that goop that we had before. And then it goes into this long tube down here. We call that the small intestine. And that's the tube that's as long as this room, and it's all been stuffed up in there. So some of the food goes through the little tiny holes into the blood. And then the stuff that doesn't do that, that your body doesn't use, goes all the way through the tube. And that waste goes into this part here. What do you think that's called? A large intestine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's the large intestine because it's larger than the small intestine. And then that waste goes all the way around here, and the large intestine holds onto it until we need to get rid of it. That's when we go to the bathroom. And that's when we go to the bathroom. That's right. I'll get it! It's Hi. Pete! Hey! Hi, Pete. How's it going? Oh, Bob, Good to see you. Yeah. What brings you to this part of the neighborhood? Well, I just thought I'd stop by and see what you all were thinking about today. We're going to the bathroom. Excuse me? Um, no, we're, uh, we're thinking about how your body gets rid of food that it doesn't use. Amazing. I can't believe this, but I once wrote a song about that very subject. You did? Most people write about love or the moon. I wrote a song about waste. Wow. Well, uh, can we hear the song? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Twist my arm, maybe. Oh, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Uh, you want to play along with yeah, me, Bob? Sure, I know sure. you I'll play uh, guitar. Yeah, okay. I'll try to follow you here. See if we can make this happen. Let's see. It's been a while. Let me see if I remember this. Okay. When you have a meal, you sometimes feel you can eat every bit of the food but when the heating starts you always find parts that aren't supposed to be chewed there's always something left over the part that you don't eat like the stem and the pick and the cob and the grit and the bone in the middle of the meat yes there's always something left over sits there in a clump so you put it in a can and then the garbage man takes it to the dump yes you put it in a can and then the garbage man takes it to the dump now after you eat and you're feeling real neat and your intestines have work to do but soon you feel hey 
part of that meal is moving all the way through cause there's always something left over the part you don't digest the body is used only part of the food and leave behind the rest yes there's always something left over it sits there in a block that's when you know I've got to go And the bathroom's your next stop Help me now, guys The bathroom, you know I've got to go The bathroom's your next stop oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Great song, great song Thank you. Pete, that's got to be the silliest the Well, the most wonderful song I think I've ever heard Well, it I'd have to admit, it probably is the best song I've ever written about waste. <laughs> well, you don't hear too many songs about that subject. <laughs> well, it's getting late. I better be heading out. Oh, well, thank you very much for dropping by, Pete. Thanks for the song. That was thank great. Thank you. Good to see you all. Okay. Bye. 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 <laughs> um, by the way, Chow, can you tell me where the bathroom is? Right around the corner. Oh, thank you. Bye, Pete. Bye. Pete. Bye. 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 Well, so far, we've only been talking about one kind of waste that your body produces. That's the solid waste. But you know that when you go to the bathroom, you also produce a yellow liquid. You know what I mean. Sometimes you just produce the yellow liquid, sometimes just the solid, sometimes it's both. Do you know the name of that liquid? Well, it's called urine. And urine is produced by a different part of your body, but it's also a waste product. Let's go back to Kathy over here. Now here's the small and large intestine. They produce the solid waste, but if we take them out, you can see just behind them there are two other little organs, these purple things here. Those are called your kidneys. And if you want to find out where your kidneys are in your body, just put your hands on your waist like this until your fingers are almost touching behind your back. One kidney is underneath your hand here, and the other kidney is under your other hand back here. Now, after food goes through your blood, the blood needs to be cleaned and get the urine out. Well, that's what the kidneys do. They clean the blood, they produce the urine, which is the leftover waste that your body doesn't use, and then it goes down these tubes here and here and into another part that's called the bladder. And the bladder is really nothing more than just a little bag. It's sort of like this balloon that's filled with liquid. And when that bladder fills up, that's when you need to go to the bathroom. And when you do need to go to the bathroom, the bag empties and you produce the urine. It's kind of neat how your body tells you how you need to go to the bathroom. You suddenly, you just don't feel very comfortable. Well, if you do get that feeling of discomfort, go. It's not good to try to hold it back. So your body produces waste by itself. It gets rid of waste by itself. But you can also help because there are certain foods that actually help your body to get rid of waste. What kinds of foods? Well, Janice went to the store to find out. Hi, Janice here, kid reporter. Today I'm at the grocery store asking people what food helps your body get rid of waste. Excuse me. Yeah? What makes waste? Doesn't everything make waste? Can you tell me what makes waste? Well, gee, I never thought about that before. Have you ever thought about that before? No, I haven't thought about that before. Excuse me, can you tell me what makes waste? That's easy. We learned it in school. I'll show you. Dad, I'll be back. I'm going to be on TV. Hi, Mom. Oh, and by the way, this is Tiffany. Hi. Well, look, everything in these aisles helps you get rid of waste. That's because fruits and vegetables have lots of fiber. What's fiber? Well, it's kind of hard to explain. It's like some foods just go through your stomach and intestine really easy. Fruits and vegetables and anything with whole grain, like this loaf of bread. Oh, I see. Can we do anything to help with our liquid waste, Tiffany? Definitely. It's good to drink lots of liquids. Like juice. And milk. And just drinking lots of water helps your kidneys make urine. Well, thanks, Tiffany. You're welcome. So that's the scoop. 
Foods with a lot of fiber, like fruits and vegetables, help your body make solid waste. And drinking a lot of liquids help your kidneys make urine. And now, back to our studio. Your body makes two kinds of waste. When you eat, the food goes to your stomach and then into your small intestine. There, most of it goes through tiny holes and enters your blood. But some of the food is left behind. That's solid waste. Solid waste goes into the large intestine, and you get rid of it when you go to the bathroom. Liquid waste, also called urine, is made in your kidneys. Your kidneys clean your blood. Urine flows from your kidneys to your bladder, which holds it until you go to the bathroom. Some kinds of food help your body make waste, like fruit and vegetables and whole grains. These foods have fiber, and that keeps your stomach and intestines working really well. And drinking a lot of liquid helps your body make urine. Well, Sarah, do you think there's anything else we need to mention about waste? Yes. What's that? It's your turn to clean out the cat box. <laughs> When you get up in the morning and look in the mirror You see your eyes, mouth, teeth, hair, ears and nose Your muscles and bones give you a real good place For you to wear your clothes You've got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart And what we think and feel is a very important part Of how we put together, why we do what we do Why I look like me and you look like you It's a bunch of neat stuff It's fun to know Watch, listen and learn with head to toe Ready? Ready! Tell us what this is. Um, a feather? Are you sure? It's a feather. It's a feather. Correct. Can you tell us what this is? A music box. Yep. Tell us what this is. I think it's a banana. And? It what? Open your mouth. Take a bite. A banana, banana with peanut butter on it. Correct. Well, how did Louisa know that it was a feather or a music box or a banana with peanut butter on it? Well, that's because she could feel, she could hear, she could smell, and she could taste. Do you know what those things are? Those are our senses, and we have five of them. We have taste, we have smell, touch, mm. hearing, and sight. And you might want to try what the kids were doing, where you cover your eyes and see if you can identify things just by touching them or smelling them or tasting them. And you'd be surprised just how much your five senses tell you about the world. What part of you hears the ocean roar and the sound of rain as it starts to pour? What part of you hears your uncle snore? That's what your ears are for. That's what your ears are for. Won't you come and sing along, learn it all day long, singing the sense of song? What part of you can touch and explore? The fur on a cat or the sand on the shore? What thing softness and sharpness and more? That's what your skin is for. That's what your skin is for. Won't you come and sing along, learning all day long, singing the sense song? What part of you can see the colors on the back of a bee and the shape of a dinosaur? That's what your eyes are for. What part of you would just adore to taste an apple down to the core and everything else? 
in the grocery store That's what your mouth is for That's what your mouth is for And what part of you Just can't ignore The smell of bread Behind the oven door What part of you Smell, smells galore That's what your nose is for That's what your nose is for Won't you come and sing along Learning all day long Sing in the sense of song I'll get it Hello Ah, just a moment It's for you, bird Thanks, Bob Hang on You know what this is, right? It's a telephone, and it can help us think about how our five senses work. When I speak into the telephone, my voice goes in here, right? But does it stay right there? Well, of course not. It becomes a message that goes down this cord, and then it goes into another cord that goes into the wall, then through a whole bunch of other cords all the way across town until it gets to the person on the other end, and they get the message. Well, the same kind of thing happens in your ear. The sound goes into your ear, and your ear sends a message along a kind of cord. The cord in your body is called a nerve. Where do you think these nerves go? To your brain. That's the place inside of your head that controls your body. Your brain gets the message that you're hearing something. It works the same way with all of your senses. Hearing, taste, smell, sight, and touch. When you taste some food with your mouth, the taste doesn't stop there. Your mouth sends a message along nerves straight to your brain. When you smell something with your nose, or see something with your eyes, or touch something with your hand, or feel something with your foot, all of those messages are sent to your brain through nerves. And the nerves end up here, in your brain. That's in my head? Yeah, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Your brain is kind of folded on itself and wrinkled, and it's actually spongy and kind of soft, but it sits in your head, just like this. Cool. Yeah, this brain's a little bigger than a real one, just so that we can see it. Actually, Larry over here can show us what the brain really looks like in the head. Let's suppose that Larry has a splitting headache today, okay? We can cut his head right down the middle, and inside, there's the brain. Can you see how it completely fills the top part of the head there? And part of the brain goes down the back, and these are nerves that connect in your neck. So those go down like this. They go down your neck, and then they go through some other nerves that are down your back. <laughs> it's ticklish because there are a lot of nerves there. And the messages from your senses come in here at the bottom of your back. Now, what do you think that your brain does with all those messages it gets from your senses? I don't know. Well, let's suppose that we're going to go for a walk in the woods, okay? So let's start walking through the woods. Nice day, having a good time. All of a sudden, your ears hear some rustling in the leaves, and your eyes see a little black animal with a white stripe down its back, and your nose smells something really awful. I'm in trouble. Well, your brain takes these senses in and thinks about them really fast, and what's it decide? I found a skunk. A skunk! So. Quickly, your brain takes those signals and sends new messages on other nerves back down to your body to tell it what to do. And your brain tells your legs to start running. Start running, legs. And your brain tells your arms to start pumping. Pump hard. And your brain tells your lungs to start breathing hard. Yeah, so you can get lots of oxygen. And... I'm ready! Yeah! <laughs> well, the important thing is that your brain takes messages from your senses thinks about them, and then sends other messages back to your body to tell it what you do. Your brain is kind of like a control center, and it controls everything that you do. Now, I wonder, when you're walking through a forest and you see a skunk, how do you know that it's a skunk? I mean, that, that may seem like a silly question, but why don't you say, hey, there's an elephant, or hey, there's my bicycle? Well, that's because you know what a skunk looks like. Your brain remembers it. Maybe. Maybe you've seen a picture of a skunk or a drawing like this. Maybe you've seen a live one at the zoo or on the side of the road. So your brain remembers what a skunk looks like so you'll know it when you see it. Now your brain doesn't remember everything. I mean, I'm always forgetting where I left my pencil. Do you forget things sometimes? Well, that's okay. Everybody does it. But what your brain remembers is amazing. I mean, you remember the letters of the alphabet. You remember that this is a baseball. You remember that this is a hat. 
you know the names of your family and your friends. And that list just goes on and on and on. And that's because remembering is the most important thing that your brain does. You know that everybody's brain is special? And your brain might be special at some things like arithmetic or spelling. And other people are special in other things. For example, I know that Arnell's brain is really good at something. What? Drawing. Oh, yeah. I try to remember things and then I try to paint them. That's right. Louisa, what do you think your brain's really good at? Well, I like to read, and I like to play games. But I also know that you like gymnastics. But does my brain do that? Absolutely. Your brain is really good at controlling everything that your body does. Well, Naomi has a friend who's really talented, and she showed us how her brain helps her do amazing things. Hi, this is Naomi, and I'm here with Karen, and Karen threw, and Merlin, her doc. Hi, Karen. Hi. Karen, what is cerebral palsy? Well, cerebral palsy means that the brain was damaged at birth, usually because not enough oxygen. And so the brain doesn't give the right messages to the muscles, and it affects some things. It's hard for me to use my arms or legs, but it doesn't affect my thinking. I can't believe you're only 16 and you're writing books. What kind of books do you write? Well, I've written a children's book about Merlin and how he helps me, and I've also written a, a mystery novel. Where do you get your ideas? Well, just anywhere. A lot of times people I know will become characters in my books and ideas that I think of or that, of things that I see in here. What other things do you write? Um, well, I write for the uh, school newspaper, which is called The Whole Press, and I also have written some essays and short stories. Do you have any problems getting around at school? Sometimes. They've done a lot to help people with disabilities at school by making things more accessible. But a lot of times it's hard because people who aren't in wheelchairs don't know what to do around people who are. How does Merlin help you at school? Well, he uh, carries my books for me. How does he help you around the house? Well, he's um, trained to uh, retrieve things that I drop because I, I can't reach the floor when I'm in my wheelchair. And um, he can go and get my mom if I need her. He opens the door for me, turns lights on and off, um, all kinds of things. How was Merlin trained to do these things? Well, he was trained by uh, Canine Companions for Independence in Ohio, and they specially train dogs to uh, assist people who have disabilities. Merlin knows about 70 commands. How do you write with your computer? My computer has a special program that can recognize my voice. If I say a word, the computer actually can, can hear it and understand it, and then it prints it on the screen. And this helps because it's hard for me to type things that are long because my hands get tired. Why do you think you're such a good student? You've won all kinds of awards and everything. I don't know. I, I, I work hard and, and I want to accomplish things, so I just work hard. So your brain is a pretty wonderful thing. It lets you think, it lets you learn, it lets you use your senses. Now, what do you think would happen if your brain was hurt somehow? Well, you may not be able to learn or think or use your senses as well as you can use them right now. You know, this model of the brain that we've been using here is actually made of plastic, and it's, it's kind of hard. If you were to hold a real brain in your hand, it would actually feel quite different. It would feel sort of soft and squishy. A real brain is about as soft as pudding. Plop. And that soft brain needs to be protected. So where does your body protect it? Well, Mr. Bones can show us that. Hi, Mr. Bones. Nice hat. Your brain is protected by a very hard bone at the top of your head called your skull. And you can feel your skull if you just tap your head lightly on the side. You feel how hard it is there? And it's hard all the way around your head. A hard skull protecting a soft brain. And it's important to protect our brains because if you hurt your brain, it's very difficult to make it healthy again. And we need healthy brains because there are five senses. Hearing, taste, smell, sight, and touch. Your sense organs send messages along cords called nerves. The nerves carry the messages to your brain. Your brain can think. It also sends messages back to your body. It's your control center. Your brain remembers things. Because you can remember, you can learn. Every brain is special and needs to be protected.
Ooh, Chiraman, hey, come on, Chris, let's go. Yeah, yeah, you quick. Can do it. The time is running out. Is he going to do it? Is he going to make it? He's in the home stretch now. Here he comes. Oh, it's getting close. And, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that was pretty good, Christopher, but now, do you think you can do it again faster than that? I'm sure I can. Okay. Come on, come on, does this time. Can do it, come on, Ooh, look at him go you this time. Look at how fast he is. You can do it, come on. Yeah, whoa, look at that. New world record, yay. <laughs> now that's using your brain. Okay, Louisie, do you want to try one too? Here, let's see if you can do another one. See if you can get, the, get across the river, okay? This is another... When you get up in the morning and look in the mirror You see your eyes, mouth, teeth, hair, ears and nose Your muscles and bones give you a real good place For you to wear your clothes You've got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart And what we think and feel is a very important part Of how we're put together, why we do what we do Why I look like me and you look like you It's a bunch of neat stuff It's fun to know Watch, listen and learn with Don't touch that dial. It's time for your favorite show, The Attack of the Invisible Invaders. Sparky, we're being attacked by invisible invaders. You mean space aliens? No, worse than space aliens. You mean ghosts? No, we don't believe in ghosts. These invisible invaders are for real. You mean? Yes, Sparky, we're being attacked by germs. Be sure to tune in next time when Sparky says, I don't feel so good. The end. Bye. Have a good flight. Say goodbye, bird. <laughs> Attack of the Invisible Invaders? It sounds like some kind of scary movie. Ooh. <laughs> but you know, invisible invaders really do exist. We call them germs. And germs are so small that you can only see them through a microscope. Germs float through the air, they land on your furniture, they cling to your drinking glass. Ugh. They even land on your skin. Germs are everywhere. And it's important that we think about germs because if they get inside your body, you can become really sick. And we all know that getting sick isn't much fun. So let's have a look through the microscope and see what these tiny germs really look like. Germs are alive. If germs like these get into your body, you might get the flu. Germs may give you a runny nose, sore throat, make you sneeze and cough so you have to stay home from school. These germs can get into your body and make you sick. But how do they get in there? I mean, your skin covers most of your body and it protects you against germs, but your skin doesn't cover everything. It has holes in it. In fact, I hate to tell you this, but you've got holes in your head. A very nice thing to say. Well, it's true, Shauna. You do have holes in your head. What do you listen with? My ears. Aha! Two big holes right in the side of your head. What do you speak with? My mouth. Aha! Another big hole right in the front of your face. And my nose is another hole. Right. So we've got three holes right there, three ways that germs can get in. But what do you do? I mean, you can't, you can't cover your ears and close your mouth and plug your nose forever. So how do we protect ourselves against those germs? Hmm. And now it's time for the Attack of the Invisible Invaders, Part 2. Sparky, the Invisible Invaders are all around us. They're on my microphone. They're on my juice glass. They're floating in the air. We have to stop them before they enter our bodies. But how? Sparky, what are you doing? 
no judge can attack me in here. There has to be an easier way. <laughs> well, Sam's right. Germs are everywhere, but you don't have to wear a rubber suit and a mask to keep them out of your body. There are other things you can do, things that are really easy. What do you think is the best way to protect yourself from germs? Should you clean your room, wash your hands, or comb your hair? What do you think is the best way to keep germs out of your body? You decide. Well, what did you decide? Shauna, do you know the answer? Wash your hands. Right. When you wash your hands, you can see the dirt gets cleaned away. But what you don't see is that most of the germs on your hands get killed. That's because soap and water kill germs. And your hands can have a lot of germs on them. Why? Because we use our hands for everything. Hello, ladies and germs. And speaking of those cuckoo nutty little wacko germs, nobody wants them. So here's a little tune about what you can do to get rid of them. What you gonna do today? What things will you make? What games will you play? Whatever you choose, you're probably gonna use your hands. Are you gonna tie your shoes? Will you comb your hair? Will you read the news? Even just reading, buddy, you'll be needing those hands. You might clean up your bedroom Or go dig around for worms But did you know that much of the world Is positively crawling with germs? What you gonna do tonight? Will you help make dinner? Will you sit and write? No matter what is done Understand if you wanna squash those germs by gosh Whenever you can just hear me man You're gonna have to wash, wash those hands Scrubby dub dub Every time you touch something, there's a chance that germs get onto your hands. So then when you touch your face, like around your eyes or your nose or your mouth, those germs could get into your body. But if you wash your hands with soap and water, that kills a lot of the germs on your hands, so there aren't as many of them to get into your body. And there are some other things you can do as well. Suppose you're outside playing and you fall down and you cut yourself. You know, I mean, it happens all the time. You scrape your knee. Well, that cut becomes another hole in your body. So if you wash the cut with soap and water, then that can prevent germs from getting in. Here's something else. Suppose you're thirsty. You'd like a drink? Go over to the sink and you see a glass sitting there. But other people have been drinking from this glass before you. Should you take a drink from it? Yes or no? Well, the answer is no. The people who drank from this class before you left germs around the rim. So when you drink from it, those germs can go into your mouth and into your body. So wash the glass before you drink from it. One more thing. Suppose a friend of yours got a really nice big lollipop and has been mm, licking it away, and they offer you a lick. Should you lick the lollipop? Yes or no? Uh-uh. Even though you can't see them, the germs are there, and they could make you sick. But you know something? Oh, hi, Mr. Bones. Nice mask. Your body is very, very good at fighting germs. Inside of your body are millions of special cells, a tiny army of germ killers that live in your blood. When germs get into your body, these special cells find the germs and attack them. These germ killers are always at work trying to keep you healthy, but sometimes they can't kill the germs fast enough. And well, that's when you get sick. So what happens then? Well, that's when your doctor or your parents give you medicine. Some medicines are germ killers too. They find the germs, attack them, and soon you feel better. Shauna has some pictures of different kinds of medicines. So Shauna, who's the guy in the picture? That's my friend Joey. Ah, so where are his medicines? Well, sometimes when you're sick, you have to take pills, and sometimes the medicine is in a bottle. When it's a liquid? Uh-huh, you take it with a spoon. This really isn't medicine, but when you're sick, getting rest is good because that helps kill germs too. 
and sometimes you have to go to the doctor and he gives you a shot. Do you like getting shots? No, I hate them. Why? Because they hurt. Oh, well, sometimes they sting just a little bit, but that's only for a moment. Then the germs are killed faster and you feel better that much quicker. So what's your last picture? That's Joey. Joey? Where? Well, he got a shot, so he felt better and he went out to play. <laughs> I should have known. You know, before we had medicine, kids got sick a lot more than they do today. Without the medicine, they got things like measles and mumps and whooping cough, and almost anybody could get those diseases. But today, we have super special germ killers, and they keep you from getting those diseases. Well, our friend Sarah went to the health clinic, and she got some of those super special germ killers. But Dad, I'm not sick. I know you're not sick. So why do I have to go to the doctors? Sarah, sometimes we have to go to the doctors even when we're not sick. Why? I'll let the doctor tell you. Okay. Ah, uh, I'm not sick. Oh, I know you're not sick. In fact, you look very healthy. So why do I have to go to the doctors? Well, we don't want you to become sick. A long time ago, kids used to get spots all over their face and cough, or their neck and face would get very swollen, or sometimes they couldn't even walk. Could that happen to me? Well, it could, but today we're going to give you a vaccine so that you don't get sick. The vaccine is in the form of a shot. Do you want a shot, or do you want to take a chance on getting sick? I think I want to have a shot. I think you made a very good choice. I know I did. Invisible invaders called germs are all around you. They can get into your body. You get a lot of germs on your hands, but soap and water kills germs. So the best way to fight germs is to wash your hands often, especially before you eat and after you go to the bathroom. And never put objects into your mouth or anything that other people have put into theirs. If germs get into your body, they're attacked by germ killers in your blood. Medicines also help kill germs in your body. Special medicines called vaccines can keep you from getting the measles and other terrible diseases. Ooh, this is terrible. This is horrible. This is the worst thing in the history of the universe. What, Sparky, what? I cut my finger. What should I do? You should know that by now. Oh yeah, you drive. Will Sparky be okay? What should he do to the cut on his finger to protect him from? The attack of the invisible invaders. Do you know? When you get up in the morning and look in the mirror You see your eyes, mouth, teeth, hair, ears and nose Your muscles and bones give you a real good place For you to wear your clothes You've got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart And what we think and feel is a very important part Of how we put together why we do what we do Why I look like me and you look like you It's a bunch of neat stuff 
It's fun to know what to listen and learn with head to toe. So are you ready, Christopher? All set. Christopher took his tape recorder and he recorded all kinds of interesting sounds and he wants us to try to guess what they are. Okay? Listen. That's easy. That's the sound of a clock. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh. That's easy. That's a drip, like out of a tap or a faucet? Yep, you're right. Okay. You'll never guess this one, though. Um, that sounded like uh, somebody playing some kind of musical instrument. No, that was wind chimes. Wind chimes. Whoa, did you get that? Wind chimes? Wow, that was great, Christopher. I've got some more. Okay. There are so many different kinds of sounds, and they tell us so much about the world. Have you ever taken the time to just stop and listen? Well, that was a siren. Was it a police car? An ambulance. Ah, okay. Well, that's a piano. Do you play the piano? No, my brother does. Oh, you just play the tape recorder, right? Very funny. <laughs> Sounds tell us so much about the world. Like, the siren tells us to get out of the way. And music, well, it just makes us feel good. But have you ever wondered, how do sounds happen? And how are we able to hear all of the sounds that are around us? Sound begins when something vibrates. That means it shakes or quivers very fast, like this violin string. That vibration makes the air around it vibrate too. The vibrating bits of air, we've colored them yellow so you can see them, spread out in all directions. When the air vibrations reach your ear, they make parts of your ear vibrate, and that's when you hear. That was the sound of somebody playing a violin. Yep. How many sounds did you get? Wow! That was a great sound, Christopher. That was really realistic. But I didn't do that. You didn't? Uh-oh. <laughs> is, is everybody okay? What happened? We accidentally tipped over a recycling bin. We were looking for these. Tin cans? We're going to make a telephone. Oh, a tin can telephone. Oh, that's a great project. We'll clean up first. Okay. Yeah. Can Christopher help you work on it? Yeah. Okay, you guys get busy there. Have you ever done that? Tried to make a telephone out of two tin cans and a string? It's a great thing to do because it really shows you how sound comes from vibrations. Now, while the kids are working on their telephone, that gives us a chance to think about what happens to those vibrations when they get inside your ears. And, oh, hi, Mr. Bones. Nice earmuffs. <laughs> when somebody says ears, what do you think of? These things, right? Well, here's a model of your ears, and it shows you what your ear looks like on the outside and on the inside. Now, let's talk about the outside part first. Now, the part of your ear that you can see on the outside of your head is called the outer ear because it's on the outside. And this part acts kind of like, well, like this. This is a cone. The kids made it. It's just out of paper. And when sound goes in here, it comes out the other end. And if I hold this up to my ears, I can hear much better now. I can hear the sound of the refrigerator motor. And I can hear the sound of the bird outside. Hello, bird. Hi, Bob. Would you like to try it? Let's do this. The kids are still working on their telephone way on the other side of the room. Can you hear them? Listen. Hello. You can hear them a little bit, but they're kind of far away. Now let's try it with this. We'll bring down our microphone here so you can hear better. Now, listen to what happens when I put the cone over top. Uh, What's it sound like now? B-E-T. What? B-E-T. Can you hear them better now? Now listen to what happens when I turn it over this way. Can you hear them now? Not as well. You hear best when your ears are pointed right at the sound. Joy, I'm going to the museum today. Are you going? So that's how the outer part of your ear works. It sort of works like this cone to direct sound into your head. In fact, you can do this yourself. 
Try this right now. Just take your hands, cup them like that, and put them behind your ears. And listen. Can you hear better? In fact, I can hear my own voice better now because my hands are directing the sound into my ear. So that's why the outside of your ear is sort of shaped like a cupped hand. And it directs the sound where? Into a hole. And that hole goes here. Now, sounds are vibrations in the air. And when they go into your ear, the first thing they hit is a drum. It looks like this. Let me take this piece out. It's called your eardrum because it really looks like a little drum. It's round, and it has a very tight skin across the center. And when sound vibrations hit that, it vibrates up and down many times a second, really fast. And I can show you how that works. In fact, this is something that you can try yourself. I've taken a glass and attached some plastic wrap to it and stretched it very tightly over the opening of the glass so that it's really tight like a drum, like your eardrum. Now, when sound vibrations hit that, it will vibrate up and down. And just to show you what that looks like, let's put some salt on top of our drum. And that's just so that we can see how it vibrates when sound hits it. Now, we need some sound. Let's see, here's a ukulele. We can use this. Watch what happens to the salt when I make a sound. Can you see how the salt vibrates? It dances around? That's because the surface of the drum is bouncing up and down, vibrating when the sound vibrations hit it. Sort of dancing to the music. In fact, it'll also work with my voice. La, 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 la. <laughs> so that's what happens when sound goes into your ear. The sound vibrations cause your eardrum to vibrate back and forth many times a second like the salt was on the glass. Now attached to your eardrum are three very tiny little bones. They're actually the smallest bones in your body. And this is called the middle ear because it's kind of in the middle of your ear. And when your eardrum vibrates like this, those bones vibrate back and forth. The bones are attached to another piece called your inner ear because it's farther in. And it's a round part right here that has liquid inside it. Now, what do you think happens when these bones vibrate? What happens to the liquid? Well, the liquid's going to vibrate too, right? So in fact, your whole ear actually vibrates and moves back and forth every time you hear a sound. Now, when that liquid moves inside, it touches a special nerve. And that nerve sends a signal off to your brain, and your brain says, I hear a sound. And I hear a sound. I'll get it. Oh, hi, Bert. Come on in. Hi, it's good to see you. Oh, I, I guess I should say, hi, Bert. <laughs> um, is this for us? Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Sorry, it's so heavy. Thank you for bringing it. Oh, I'll put it over here. Um, hey, Bert, uh, do you have time to meet somebody? Sure. This is our friend, Bert. He uh, brings a lot of the neat things that come to this place. Oh, hi, Joy. Hi. You, you two know each other? Yes. Oh, wow. Yes, I remember the signs you taught me. Watch. This is bird. This is river. We are, we are going to make a telephone. Uh, we'll show you uh, when it's finished. Oh, okay. Bye, Bye Bert. Sorry, you got to go. <laughs> I have to go to work on the telephone. Okay, you go work on that with the other kids. Gee, I wonder what this is. Fun stuff. I'll have to open that later. Hmm. Do you hear all of the sounds around you? Are your ears okay? Well, one of the ways that you can find out is to have your ears tested. And that's what Diego did last week. And I'm going to put these on. We're going to do one ear at a time. You're going to hear some different sounds. It's going to go kind of beep, beep, beep. Okay. Can you hear the beep? I want you to just raise your hand for me, okay? This one real high. Okay. If you have any questions, you stop me. Okay, ready? Yeah. Okay, we're going to do the right ear first. Raise your hand when you hear the sounds for me. Good. Now it's going to get softer. Listen for this one. Good. Good. Now, same thing in the other ear.
good job. Okay, now this is a graph. Going across here on this graph are the pitches from low pitch to high pitch. Going down is loudness. Down to this black line is considered within normal. The red marks are his right ear, blue marks are his left ear. So it all looks very much within normal across the board at all the pitches. So everything looks very normal. Looks great. You did a good job. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Well, Diego's hearing is very good, and that's great. But he still needs to protect his ears because if you don't protect your ears, you can lose your hearing, especially when it comes to things like loud sounds. So if you listen to music, especially the real boomy kind, if it's too loud, it can damage your ears. That's why people who work in loud places, they wear things like this. These are ear protectors, and they block out a lot of those loud sounds so the ears are not damaged. Did you know that you can damage your own ears? Every time you clean them, you should never ever stick anything like this inside your ear. This is a cotton swab. Now you can clean lots of things with these, but not your ears, because your ear drum, remember that little drum that's just inside your ear? Well, if you put a cotton swab in, it could push against that, and it could damage your ear drum and damage your hearing. So if you're gonna wash your ears, do it with a cloth, and just wash the outside of your ear, and do it very gently. It's important to keep your ears healthy because the world is full of sounds. Sounds begin when something vibrates. Vibrations travel through the air to our ears. The ear has five major parts. The outer ear, which you can see. The eardrum. Three bones attached to the eardrum, which pass vibrations on to the liquid in the inner ear, which sends a message through a nerve all the way to your brain. Some people are hearing impaired. Many of them use signs to communicate. You can have your hearing tested. Loud sounds might damage your ears and never ever put anything inside of them. So, what's in the box? Well, I don't know. This is the box that Bert brought me, so let's see what it is in there. Ooh, look at that. Isn't that nice? That's a seashell. You know, they say that you can hear the sound of the ocean in a seashell if you listen like this. Oh, yeah. Can you hear something, Christopher? Yeah. Isn't that neat? Maybe we can all try it later on. Bob, we got our tin can telephones ready. You did? Okay, well then let's try it out and see how it works. Oh, a really long string you've got on that. Okay. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Does this thing work? I hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, really loud. Isn't that great? The phone really works. Now, why do you think that the tin can telephone really does work? Well, now that you know something about vibrations, maybe you can figure it out. Bob? Yes, Sarah? It's for you. For me? Who's calling me here? Hello? <gasps> I told you not to call me here. <laughs> Did it work? <laughs> Did you, could you really hear through that? Yeah, it really works through the string, doesn't it? Yeah. Could you? Yeah. When you get up in the morning and look in the mirror You see your eyes, mouth, teeth, hair, ears and nose Your muscles and bones give you a real good place For you to wear your clothes You've got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart And what we think and feel is a very important part Of how we put together, why we do what we do Why I look like me and you look like you It's a bunch of neat stuff It's fun to know Watch this and then learn with Hi, Naomi. Come on in. Hi. Chow and Sarah are already here. So what's new? What's different about me? What's different about you? Uh, 
You have a new shirt. No. No. Uh, okay. Uh, you have a new pair of shoes. No. No. Well, there is something different about you, but I can't quite see what it is. Uh, what? I know. You've got a new haircut. Bob! Uh, oh, you have new glasses. I didn't notice that. Hey, everybody, come here. Look, Naomi's got some new hair. Of course. Isn't that neat? Can you see better now? A lot better. Before, I had trouble seeing things far away. Well, how did you know what kind of glasses to get? I went to the eye doctor. Okay, Naomi, I'm going to have you hold this, and I want you to cover up your right eye for me. And you see that chart out there? I want you to tell me the smallest row of letters that you can read. And uh, take a guess. It's all right to guess. O H P L C. Good job. Okay, now I want you to cover your other eye, and I want you to do the same thing. Tell me the smallest row of letters that you can possibly read. Okay, Naomi, I'm going to have you put these red-green glasses on. Okay, can you see those dots out there? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to cover one eye. Tell me what's the number of dots and what color they are. Three, and they're green. Good. And what about now? Two, and they're red. Okay, now what we're going to have you do, I want you to look out in the distance for me. And just keep looking out there. Good. I'm going to be shining this light in your eye. Just keep looking out there. Good. Okay, now what we're going to do is put some lenses in front of your eyes. And you go ahead and sit back and see if this, these lenses will improve your vision any. What I'm going to have you do is look out at that chart. Can you see that row of lines? Yeah. All right, I want you to tell me when that first gets a little bit blurry to you. A little blurry. You can, it's a little blurry. Can you make it out here? No. No. Okay, I want you to tell me when you can first see a letter on that line. I can see a letter. Okay, does this improve in any? Yeah. Okay, what about here? Or does it look the same? Um, it just looks the same. It looks the same. Good. Okay, I want you to keep looking at that row of letters. And I want you to tell me which one looks better to you. One. Or two? One. Good. Okay, Naomi, what we're going to do now, if you look out through those lenses, and then look out without the lenses, which looks better? With the lenses. Okay, good. So what we're going to do now is go to the frame room and help you pick out some glasses for your new prescription. Okay. Okay. The only hard part was deciding which ones look best. Yeah. I like these. And these are the ones I picked. Well, they look great. Well, you know, since we're talking about glasses, this might be a good time to think about how our eyes work. Do you guys know how your eyes work? No, no, no. Well, let's go over here and have a look at what the eye looks like on the inside. This is a model of the eye. It sure is big. Yeah, it is, Sarah. It's a lot bigger than your real eye, but that's just so that we can see what it looks like in all its different parts. Looks kind of complicated, doesn't it? Hmm. Now, where should I start? Uh, okay, I know. One of the things that your eyes can do is move. Can you move your eyes and your head? Can you move your eyes and your head? Back and forth, side to side, like that. Now, it's a good thing that your eyes can move because, well, can you imagine what it would be like if your eyes looked straight ahead all of the time? Hey, what do you think it would be like to read a book? I'll show you. Yeah, that's right. Left, right, left, right, left, right. That's right. Your neck muscles would get pretty sore just reading a book. You know, you look like a cat when you do that. The cats cannot move their eyes very much in their head. And if you play with a cat, they have to follow. If you play with a string, you know, the cat goes, whoop, 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 whoop. They move their whole head because they can't move their eyes like we can in our head. You know something else? Because your eyes can move in your head, you can see when you walk down the street. If your eyes were just straight ahead, everything would be really blurry. It'd be something like this. You know what this is? A camera. Yeah. Wait, it's a video camera. Now it's kind of like an eye, isn't it? Sort of like an electric eye. And this part at the front here, the eye of the camera, cannot move in the camera like your eyes can move in your head. So, if you walk with a camera down the street, and you're not careful, and you're just kind of going, -da 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 -da. Oh, look at that over there. Oh, look at that down there. Look at this up here. 
the picture gets really blurry, right? Because it's moving too fast. It can't compensate. But when you walk down the street, you can move your head and your eyes stay pointed straight ahead. Can you do that? See if you can look straight ahead, move your head up and down like that, or side to side, and keep your eyes straight ahead. See how your eyes can keep looking? And that's so that you can see when you walk. Well, what do you think it is that makes your eyes move like that in your head? Muscles. Muscles, muscles right. Anything that moves in your body moves by muscles. And that's what these red things are, these long red things on the eye. Those are the muscles that make it move. And those little muscles work really hard because your eyes are moving all the time. Those muscles move about 100,000 times a wow. day. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Never stop moving. Now, there's another part of your eye. Suppose you were sitting in a room by a window. And all of a sudden, this really bright sunbeam comes flashing through at you. What would you do, Naomi? I'd shut the shade. And what would that do? Keep the light from coming in. Right. Well, there's a part of your eye that does the same thing as a window shade. And it's called the iris. And it's right at the front. And that's the part of your eye that usually has color to it. And in fact, hmm, I can see three different colors of iris right here. Chow's iris is kind of brown. And Sarah's iris is kind of blue, hazel. And Naomi's iris is really dark brown. Oh, what color are mine? Brownish, brownish green. reddish. Brownish green. <laughs> Here's an iris. Watch what happens when the light gets brighter. Did you see it close down? And when the room gets darker, the iris opens wide. Now that black spot in the middle of your eye that gets big and small when light shines on it, that has a name. And it's called the pupil. Pupil? Like in school? Well, <laughs> yeah, it's got the same name as the pupils in school, Sarah. But this one's a little different. Let's look at the pupil that's in the iris of this eye. We'll take it apart here. First, we'll take the muscles off, these red things. Remember the muscles that let your eye move in all those different ways? And we'll take the eyeball off the top here. And right at the very front of the eye, there's the iris. That's the part that has the color. And right in the middle, you see that hole? That is the pupil. Now, I wonder, what would it be like if light could not go through that hole? Could you not can't see anything. Yeah, that's right. If there was no light going through the pupil, it would be dark. You couldn't see anything at all. Now, after the light goes through that, then... Um, Chow, can I borrow your magnifying glass that you were using earlier? Sure. Do you want to look at something with it? Yes, I do, Sarah. I want to look at something, but I also want to look at a part of the magnifying glass itself. Have you ever seen one of these? Do you know what the glass part of the magnifying glass is actually called? Naomi, do you know? The lens. Very good. It's the lens, just like the lenses in your glasses. And lenses are neat because you can look at things with them. And sometimes things look kind of fuzzy, but then when you bring it down a bit, it gets really clear and it becomes focused. You can see a nice clear picture with the lens. Well, right at the front of your eye is a lens. Look at this. It's got exactly the same shape. It's curved. And when light goes through that, it can make focus pictures just like a magnifying glass can. Now, you can actually make a working model of your eye with stuff you can find in your kitchen. Here's something you might try at home. All you need is a tin can. This is going to be a tin can eye. Take the ends out of both ends of it. You need an elastic band and a piece of waxed paper. And it's very easy to make. You just put the waxed paper over one end of the can like this and pull it down so that it makes a nice tight drum. And then just hold it on with the elastic band so it's nice and smooth like that. And then you put the magnifying glass in front and you have an eye, believe it or not. Now if you want to see how it works, come on around behind me. Now eyes like to look at something, so let's look at something interesting like Mr. Bones over there. We hold the magnifying glass up and... Wow. There he is, look at that. He's upside, upside down. down. That's right, he's upside down. And do you know that the lens in your eye actually makes the picture on the back of your eye upside down? But your brain turns it the right way around. But there's a full color picture. Now, let's see if we can get a real face over there. Naomi, do you want to go stand beside Mr. Bones? And let's see if we can see Naomi. Oh, there she is. Yeah, see her? <laughs> How are you doing? I waved the camera. Yeah, there she is. It's nice and clear. standing on the ceiling. <laughs> that's right. So your eyes are really complicated, aren't they? And they're very delicate, too. And that's why they need to be protected. That's why you have eyelashes, these little hairs that are around your eyes. Why you have eyelids, so you can squint them closed to keep out dust and dirt and even too much light. 
there are other things you can do to protect your eyes. If you read in a dark place, your eyes become strained and they get tired. You might get a headache. So always make sure you have enough light when you read. And whenever you're making something, and pieces of wood or metal or even paper might be flying around, use eye protection. It's the same when you play sports, or even when you're just mowing the lawn. If things are flying around that could get into your eyes, wear eye protection. Because your eyes are very soft, you don't want to get anything in them that could scratch them. Bob? Sarah, what's the matter? Why are you crying? I'm not crying. I just got something in my eye. Something in your eye? Turn around here. Let me see. Look up. Oh, yeah. I think you've got a hair in it. Just a minute. Let's see if I can get it here with this tissue. Here, we'll wipe up your tear. Okay, just turn around a little. Okay, watch. There it is. There. I think I got it. Does that feel better? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Bob? Yeah? Why am I I cry when I got something in it? Why did you cry? Well, that's your eye's way of washing itself. You know, tears aren't just for crying. They're there all the time, and they keep your eye nice and moist. And whenever your eye feels something in it, like a piece of dirt or, or this hair that you got in there, then your eye turns the tears on, and the tears wash whatever it was away. Oh, so crying is good sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> See ya. You know, Sarah did the right thing in telling me that she had something in her eye. If you ever get something in your eye, tell an adult and don't try to rub it, because that could actually make it worse. Some people's eyes don't work very well. They see the world kind of fuzzy like this. So their eyes need help, and they put on glasses. And the glasses make everything clear, and they can see much better. Your eye has many parts. Muscles move your eyes up and down and from side to side. The iris opens and closes, like a window shade, to control the amount of light. The hole in the middle of the iris is called the pupil. The lens in your eye is clear and curved. It focuses the light on the back of your eye. From there, a nerve carries the message to the brain and you can see. Everyone should have their eyes tested. Glasses help many people see better. Protect your eyes from anything that could fly into them. Make sure you have enough light when you read. And when you get something in your eye, tears can help wash it away. Well, everybody, did you learn something interesting today? Yep. Yep. A lot. Great. Would you say that today's show was a real eye-opener? <laughs> Get it? Yeah? Get it? Eye-opener? <laughs> hey, come on. Come on. It's a joke. It's funny. You're supposed to laugh. Hey, come on, everybody. Eye-opener. Don't you get it? You know, f eh. Well, at least he's grinning about it. <laughs> I thought it was funny. When you get up in the morning and look in the mirror You see your eyes, mouth, teeth, hair, ears and nose Your muscles and bones give you a real good place For you to wear your clothes You've got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart And what we think and feel is a very important part Of how we put together why we do what we do Why I look like me and you look like you It's a bunch of neat stuff It's fun to know Watch, listen and learn with head to toe Okay, everybody, hold still. Smile. Uh, wait a minute. Something's missing. Everybody's here. No, that's not what I mean, Arnell. Something else is missing. Something in Jody's mouth. Did you lose something yesterday? Oh, my tooth. What happened to it? It just fell out. Wow, that's kind of neat. It looks like you've lost more than one, though. Yes, 
I lost other ones. Yeah, I lost some too. You have Arno? Eight of them. Wow. Have you lost any teeth recently? Dad, why do we lose our baby teeth? That's a very good question, Tiffany. Maybe that's why today's a good day to think about our teeth. Hmm. You probably know that your first set of teeth don't last very long. We sometimes call them your baby teeth. Somewhere around the age of five or six or seven, you begin to lose your baby teeth one at a time. That's good because they're being pushed out by new, bigger, stronger teeth. We call those new teeth your permanent teeth or your adult teeth. I can show you why that happens. This is a model of baby teeth. Now, Jody can already see that these teeth are loose and they're coming out. But what she cannot see is what's happening behind this pink skin that we call the gums. Behind that, there's another row of teeth. These are the baby teeth, and below and above them are the permanent teeth. Now, let's just look at the top row. Here are the baby teeth, and here are the permanent teeth. Now, they're pretty small right now, but as they grow and get bigger, they push the baby teeth out. So eventually, one by one, all the baby teeth are replaced with a set of permanent teeth. And these are called permanent teeth because if you take care of them, you have them for the rest of your life. And Bob! Or no, what? Jody's permanent teeth have already grown in. Already? Uh-huh, look. Whoa, boy, <laughs> you must have a hard time brushing those teeth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you wise guys. Somehow I feel that those were not really Jody's permanent teeth. But it did get me thinking. Do you brush your teeth? I'm sure people have told you that if you don't brush your teeth, you're going to get cavities. But have you ever wondered what makes cavities? You might be surprised. Let me show you. Have you ever heard the word acid? This is how you spell it. A-C-I-D. Acid. Now, do you know what acids are? Well, there are lots of different kinds of acids, but some of them can actually eat away or burn other materials. Let me show you what a little bit of acid can do. This is a piece of limestone, and it's very hard material. And this is a very powerful acid. In fact, this acid is so strong that I have to protect my skin, so I have to wear some gloves so that it won't get on my skin. This acid is stronger than any acid you'd have at home in your school, so you'd never do this kind of experiment yourself. I also have to protect my eyes because I don't want any of this acid to splash into my face. Now watch what happens when I just take a few drops in this eyedropper of this acid and put it on the limestone. So we'll just get a few drops drawn up in here and watch what they do. And look at how that acid eats away at that very hard limestone. It's also turning it brown. And if I was to keep doing that, eventually that acid would eat right through that piece of limestone. Here's a piece that we put some acid on earlier, and you can see how it's eaten it away. It turned it really brown like that. And there's a big depression here, and see there, it's almost all the way through that very hard stuff. This is stone and the acid ate its way right through it. Well, your teeth, the covering on the outside of your teeth, the white part, is very hard material. In fact, it's the hardest material in your body, and you want to take care of that so that you'll have your teeth for the rest of your life. But cavities are holes in that hard outer covering. Here's one here, and there's another one there. And you can see how they're brown, and they've gone right through that hard covering. Now, what can make those holes in the covering of your teeth? Well, you've probably already guessed. Acids. You have acids in your mouth, and they eat away at your teeth and make holes in them. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, wait a minute, I don't eat acid. I mean, I eat fruits, I eat vegetables, I eat yogurt, I eat meat. I wouldn't put a, a dangerous chemical like that in my mouth, and you never should put a chemical like that in your mouth because it is very dangerous. So, how do you get cavities? Well, something happens to the food that you put in your mouth. After you chew your food, you swallow most of it. But some food is always left in your mouth, along the gums and in the spaces between your teeth. A lot of food has sugar in it. When it mixes with the liquids in your mouth, it turns into acid. And that acid can start to make tiny holes in your teeth. And before you know it, ouch, you have cavities. 
So, sugary food left in your mouth turns into acid. So if you don't want cavities, you have to clean that food away. And <laughs> it looks like Tiffany has the best way to do that. Brush your teeth. Exactly. And how often should you brush your teeth, Tiffany? After every meal and before you go to bed. Right. Now, brushing your teeth is important, but so is how you brush your teeth. Tiffany, would you like to show us how to do that? Okay. I'll be the mouth. You should always brush up and down in the direction that your teeth grow. You may open up, Bob. Oh. And do the same on the inside. And don't forget the tops. You may close now, Bob. It's also important to brush your gums. It helps to keep them healthy. That's great, Tiffany. Thank you. If you brush your teeth like that after every meal and before you go to bed, you will wash away that leftover food and you'll have fewer cavities. But is brushing your teeth enough? Does it get all of the food? Well, recently, Christopher learned a whole lot about that. Looks good. Doing a good job brushing. Keep it out. Just going to make sure we don't have any hard deposits down here, that tartar, that calculus. So check up here, right up along here. I want you to get that toothbrush up along your gums and brush your teeth and your gums real gentle there on the outside and on the inside there. Good job. No cavities. That's what we like. You come in here every six months with no cavities, that's good. You ready to get them cleaned? Shine them up for you. You're doing super. Wish everybody was as good a brusher as you. Okay, we're going to do your fluoride treatment now. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. I'm going to have you take half of that in your mouth. I want you to swish it around. Good job. I'll take that. I'm going to time you for one minute. And then we'll let you spit into the sweeper. Okay? Swish it in and out between your teeth. That's important. Okay, we're done with the fluoride. You're done with your cleaning. No cavities. That's good. I'm going to send you home with a new toothbrush. When she teaches it every day, at least twice a day. Okay. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. How about a prize or a sticker or something? Yeah, okay. All right. You brushed in the front. You brushed in the back You brushed every night before bed So you were feeling confident When the dentist took a look But boy, were you surprised When the dentist said You have two cavities Two cavities? I found two cavities Two cavities The news was very hard to take I yelled, there must be some mistake when the dentist said, You have two cavities. I brushed in the front, I brushed in the back, I brushed after every single meal. I even take my toothbrush to school every day. So this cavity thing just can't be real You have two cavities Two cavities You have two cavities Two cavities Am I getting my point across? You really also have to floss It's a shame, but you have two cavities Floss Just floss and you will see a great big smile when the dentist says <gasps> I found no cavities Now you floss in the front And you floss in the back The dentist got her point across And I haven't had a cavity In two whole years No, she hasn't had a cavity In two whole years There hasn't been a cavity So, 
brushing and flossing and getting a regular checkup. All of these keep your teeth clean on the outside, but you can also keep your teeth healthy and strong from the inside. Right, Arnell? Hi, do you know what food is best for your teeth? Let's see. What drink is best for your teeth? Soda, milk, orange juice. You have five seconds. Uh, time's up. What did you pick? The answer is milk. Anything made out of milk makes your teeth strong and healthy. Remember that. Now, which one of these foods is good for your teeth? Candy, bread, or cheese? The candy thing we can get rid of right away because everybody knows candy's not good for your teeth. So, bread, or cheese. You have five seconds. But time's up. The correct answer is cheese. Did you get that? I told you that anything that was made from milk was good for your teeth. And cheese is made from milk. One more. Which one of these is good for your teeth? Buttermilk or yogurt? Warning, this is a trick question. You have five seconds. But time's up. The answer is both of them. All right. Your baby teeth are soon replaced by permanent teeth. The covering on your teeth is the hardest part of your body. But sugar and food left in your teeth turns into acid and causes cavities. The best way to get rid of that food is to brush after every meal and before bed. And to clean the spaces between your teeth, you should floss every day. A checkup every six months will keep your teeth clean and healthy, and you'll catch any small cavities before they turn into big ones. To strengthen your teeth from the inside, drink milk and eat cheese and yogurt. Boy, isn't it great that a delicious tasting food like ice cream is also good for you? Good for your teeth, because it's made with milk. What do you think about all this, Arnell? I say this is something you can sink your teeth into. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Now, wait a minute. Before you eat, I still haven't got my picture of you guys. So, all right, everybody. Ice cream. This is? It's Arnell when he was only six months old. I was a cute kid. And here's another cute kid. This is a picture of Luisa. I was only one years old. And this baby's even younger. It's a picture of Sarah when she was only a few months old. I already had a lot of hair. Do any of you remember being that little? No. Uh, no. You know, it wasn't that long ago since you were a baby, and you couldn't do very much back then. 
Adults had to do almost everything for you. They had to feed you and clothe you and keep you warm. But now you can do all of those things by yourself. And that's what we want to talk about today. How you've become bigger and stronger and faster. And, and more wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> and more wonderful. Come here, clown. <laughs> Every day. You know, when you think about all of the things that you can do, you really see just how much you've learned since you were born. Right? Yep. Here's something that you might have used when you were a little kid, right? Yeah. This was probably the most important toy to you in the whole world when you were a baby. Huh? Yeah? Do you use rattles now? No. No. You don't play with rattles. Now, what kind of toys do you play with now? What do you like? Hmm? Books. Books, yeah, sure. You like to read books. I like to read books, too. Here, nice storybook there. And what, what else? What else do you like to read? Hey? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, sure. I just happen to have a dinosaur right there. Yeah, what else? What building sets. Building sets. Well, I just happen to have a building set right there. Sure, go build yourself jump a bridge. Rope. Jump rope. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, good exercise there on the jump rope. There you are. Cards. Nice. Cards. Oh, you want to have a game of cards? I think I got some. Oh, there's a game of cards. Checkers. Checkers. I, that's something that I like to play. You know, I like to play games. I like to play games like checkers. And here's another one that I'm, I'm still learning. I'm not very good at this one. This one's called the... The ball in a cup. You, you have to try to get the ball to, to stay in the cup like that, except you can't put it there with your hand. You have to, have to do it like this. Watch. Huh. It, oh, almost had it. Yeah, I'm not very good at that. I'm still trying to learn it. Maybe you like to make up some games by yourself. Or maybe you like to play one of these things. Hmm? I know Arnell likes to play computer games. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. But... Isn't there a big difference between this computer game and this rattle? You didn't play computer games when you were a baby. Now you can because you're bigger and you're smarter. This is Berkeley. She's a cat. My mom said I could have a cat only if I took care of her myself. So that means I got to feed Berkeley, make sure she gets water, clean out her box. That's my job. I do it every day. Say hi, Berkeley. I'm so proud that I take such good care of Berkeley. I draw pictures mostly with my crayons or chalk. But for my birthday, I got a bunch of markers and this is what I did with them. I'm very proud that I made this picture because this is some place that I made up. It has three sons and people with green hair. Oh, and you can see that ping pong balls grow out of the trees. Even though this is a made-up place, I would still like to go here someday. I do gymnastics. I used to just do it myself, like doing cartwheels in the park. But now I go to gymnastics class. More learning tumbling and handstands, and my favorite thing, which is sort of like dancing and tumbling at the same time. Oh, and we had a gymnastics meet, and I was in it, and I got a ribbon. I'm proud that I can do gymnastics. Yeah. Drawing, taking care of a pet, gymnastics, these are all things that you can do now. Ah, almost had it. And you're learning to do new things every day. So, you can do a lot. In fact, if we were to make a list of all of the things that you can do, it would probably be quite long. Let's watch. When I was a baby, I didn't do much except eat and sleep and cry. Now that I'm older, I do lots of things. Did you know that I can, I can whistle a tune, draw a cartoon, look at the moon, and use a spoon, and maybe someday soon, a flight of balloon.
Yes, you can do a lot of things all by yourself. But that means that you get to make choices. Maybe you choose what you do when you come home from school. You might choose what you're going to eat at a restaurant. I know you choose what toys you're going to play with. I've chosen this one, even though I'm not very good at it. And many of the choices that you make every day affect your health. But do you make healthy choices? Let's see. When you come home for lunch, do you run right to the table and start eating? Or do you wash your hands first? Which is the healthier choice? After you finish lunch, do you run right out and jump on your bike to go for a ride? Or do you brush your teeth first? Which choice is better for your body? Look at this great tree. It'd be fun to climb all the way to the top, but it's very high and it could be dangerous. So do you climb right up? Or do you wait until a parent or an adult tells you that it's okay to go that high? You can make these decisions, and you can do it. Just like you can ride a bicycle or turn a somersault, you can make the decisions that are best for your health. In fact, that's what growing up is all about, making healthy choices. Here's one more. Arnell and Joy and their dad went camping. They had some choices to make. Did they make healthy choices? Let's see. Joy and Arnell love to go camping with their dad. This time, their friend Chow came along too. You guys know how to put up this tent? Of course, I do it all the time. Are you sure you know how to put up this tent? Yeah. No, but we can figure it out. Well, if you need any help, just ask me. The kids have to make a choice. Okay, Dad, we need some help. All right, I'm coming. Asking for help when you need it is always a good choice. We did it, Chuck. All right. Team. Hey, we're a good team. What do you say if I get everybody something to drink? Yeah. All right, come on, let's get it. All right, let's see what we have here. Okay, we got fruit juice, we got soda, and we got some water. What would be a healthy choice? I'll take fruit juice. Okay, there you go. I'll take water. Water? All right. Juice for me, please. Juice for you too? Okay. That's the healthy idea. Hey, who's going to help me make lunch? Chow is having fun all by himself, but he has to make a choice. I'm coming. Doing your part when there's work to be done. That's a great choice. Hey, you guys hurry up over there. It's time to eat. Wash your hands real good now. Well, there's a lot of things we can do out here. We can take a hike, or maybe it'd be fun to even go fishing. I want to do everything. Well, we can try. Yes! Look at that pine tree. I like it. Yeah, it's going to be big one day. Real big.
it would be fun to see where that groundhog lives, but Chow and Arnell have to make a choice. Arnell, your dad told us to stay close, to be safe. Arnell! Yeah, you're right. But I bet you I can beat you to him. I don't get fishing. What do you mean? Nothing ever happens. Well, you have to be patient. Whoa, I think I've got something. What, what is it? It's gigantic. It's a shark. It? It's a very, very big shark. It's a bucket. It's a bucket shark. Very dangerous. Nice fish. <laughs> so what happened then? Well, we made a campfire, we roasted marshmallows, and we told ghost stories. Ghost stories? Boy. You had a pretty good time on that trip, didn't you? Yeah. Well, listen, let's take this um, <clears throat> shark. Ooh, looks like a scary one. Let's put it over here someplace special. It's good to save things that you're proud of, things that remind you of good times or when you did good things. So we're going to put your bucket shark up here on the shelf, okay? When you were a baby, you couldn't do very much. Now you're learning all kinds of new things. You're proud of the things you can do. Now that you can do a lot of things, you have to make choices. It's up to you to make the choices that will keep you healthy and strong. Can you guess who this is? It's me. Yes, they did have cameras back then. I can do a lot of things now that I couldn't do then. I can drive a car. I can sail a boat. I can play guitar. Lots of things that I've learned to do. And you know something else? I'm still learning new things every day. <laughs> what do you think? Okay, you try it. See if you can get it on the first time. <laughs> that was pretty good. I got it right the first time. <laughs> oh, I guess I got lucky. When you get up in the morning and look in the mirror You see your eyes, mouth, teeth, hair, ears and nose Your muscles and bones give you a real good place For you to wear your clothes You've got your lungs and stomach and brain and heart And what we think and feel is a very important part Of how we're put together, why we do what we do Why I look like me and you look like you It's a bunch of neat stuff It's fun to know Watch, listen and learn with Some things in your house are waiting to get you. Ooh. They're in the kitchen. They're in every room. Ooh. You might not even be safe even in your own bedroom. And that's because... Lots of things can get you if you don't watch out. Christopher knows. Watch. Ooh. I'm standing in front of one of the most dangerous places on Earth. This is where they keep poison and sharp knives and explosives and mysterious drugs. Scary, huh? Today I'm going in this dangerous place. Why? Because I live here. Come on. 
Mom, I'm home. Hi, Chris. I'll see you in just a minute. Know what? Every year, more kids get hurt at home than any place else. It's true. That's because we like to play, and some of the things we play with are really dangerous. I'll show you some of the things in my house that are dangerous. My dad goes hunting, so he keeps his guns in the house. They're usually locked up, but sometimes the door's open. I could play with the guns if I really wanted to, but I'd never do that because I know that thousands of kids every year get hurt from playing with real guns. Some of them even get killed. There's one more thing. There's something in every single room that can burn you. It's not fire, but still can burn you really bad up there and over there. Electricity. It's everywhere in your house, but that doesn't mean it's safe. Never put anything into a wall socket or in a light. That means your fingers or a pen or a toy or anything. And if you ever see sparks or smoke, run and tell your parents. Electricity is not a toy. You think that's scary? This place is even worse. The kitchen. First of all, look at all these knives. They are definitely sharp and they could definitely cut your skin wide open. Never use a knife unless a grown up is with you. Second of all, look down here. What's in all these bottles and cans? I'll tell you what, poison. If you swallow it, they might have to take you to the hospital. And some of it hurts if you just get it on your skin. I'm telling you, stay out of here. Under the sink is definitely a grown-up place. And so is this. Medicine. When you're sick, it might be good for you. But if you swallow medicine that's for somebody else, it can make you sick. Let your parents give you medicine when you need it. Tools can be really handy. But if you don't use them right, they can also be dangerous. So never use a tool unless a grown-up is with you. There are a lot of things that can get me in my house. But I'm not scared, because if you know what to play with and what not to play with, you'll be safe at home. Loud. Yeah, well, it's supposed to be loud so that you'll hear it whenever there's a fire. A smoke alarm can save your life. Oh, somebody at the door here. Just a minute. Hi, oh, Bob. Hi, Paula. Hi, hi, kids. Hi, Listen, hi. I just passed by and heard the smoke alarm. Is everything okay? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. We, were, we were just testing it. And we're actually, we're talking about safety. Safety? Yeah. I just happened to know a song about safety. Would you like to hear it? Oh, come on. You don't have a yeah. song about safety? Well, come on. Yeah, come on. Okay. We'd like to hear it. Come on. <laughs> Actually, I've been singing this song quite a bit to my new baby. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, come on in. Paula's got a song about safety. Hi, Paula. Hi, Sam. Guess what? I brought my own music, too. Really? You did? How'd you do that? Huh? It's okay to play. It's okay to have fun. And secrets are okay, too. But you really gotta think about what you're playing with And what you're playing with could do So if you aren't really sure or you just don't know I've got something to share with you Just play it smart, just play it safe Cause you don't want an ouchie or a bandage Or a big black and blue boo-boo Play it safe if you don't know what it is, play it safe, just leave it alone. Play it safe, if you don't know what it'll do, play it safe, just leave it alone. Play it safe, and before you play, find out what it is, and if it's okay, play it safe, just leave it alone, and you'll be safe at home. Play it safe if you don't know what it is. Play it safe, just leave it alone. Play it safe 
if you don't know what it'll do play it safe just leave it alone play it safe and before you play find out what it is and if it's okay play it safe just leave it alone and you'll be safe at home whoa a great song Paula. <laughs> thanks oh, look at the time i've got to go bye 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 bye, Paula. bye. bye. Wow, wasn't that a great song on safety? Yeah. yeah great. Wow. And wasn't it scary how Paula just happened to know a song about safety just as we were talking about a smoke alarm? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> but you know, it is important to talk about safety and smoke alarms and fire. For example, what do you think the first thing is that you should do if there's a fire in your house? Should you try to put the fire out yourself? Should you get out of the house? Should you Try to grab all your toys and things and try to save them. You decide. And the correct answer is... Get out of the house! As quickly as possible. Don't try to put the fire out yourself because that's a very difficult thing to do and you might actually make it worse. And don't try to save anything because the most valuable thing in the house is you. Your parents and your friends want you to be safe too. So meet them outside or if there's nobody around, go to a neighbor. Now, suppose... You wake up in the middle of the night and your bedroom is completely filled with smoke and there's so much smoke that you can't see anything. Do you know what to do? Do you know, Tiffany? Yes. Can you show us? Sure. <coughs> oh no, the room's all full with smoke. I can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Did you see what she did? She got down on her hands and knees and crawled out of the room. Good stuff, Tiffany. And that's what you should do because smoke always rises to the top of the room first. So if this room actually was filled with smoke, it may only come down to about here. Down here, there may not be any smoke at all, so you can not only breathe better, but you can see better as well. I know something else. What's that? I know what to do if our clothes ever catch on fire. I do too. So do I. Okay, then why don't you all tell us what to do when your clothes are on fire? Stop, drop, and roll. Bravo, bravo. Just think, stop, drop, and roll. Don't try to run because that might make the fire worse. So stop what you're doing, then drop to the ground and roll around. <laughs> and that's the best thing to do if your clothes ever catch on fire. So what is it, kids? Stop, stop drop, drop, and, and roll. roll. Going places is a lot of fun, but you have to be careful when you're not at home because you can hurt yourself in a lot of different ways. Sam and Chow and Naomi can show us some of the things that they do to be safe when they're not at home. There are lots of things you can do to make bike riding safer, like this book bag. If I didn't have a book bag and I had to carry some books home from school, I could only ride with one hand. And that's not only dangerous, it's stupid. You should always ride with both hands. And I have reflectors. I have one on the front, and one on the back, and one on both wheels. And I have a light, in case I'm ever out riding with my parents and it gets dark. I want cars to be able to see me, and hear me. But do you know the thing on my bike that makes it really, really safe? Me! I make my bike safe, because I know how to ride safely. I always ride on the right side of the road. I stop at stop signs and, of course, at red lights. This isn't very smart. See, when we ride side by side, we take up almost the whole street. Then cars can't get by. This is much better. Now cars can get by. Do you know the hand signals for turning? This means I'm turning right. This means I'm turning left. I walk places every day. When I cross the street, I always cross at the corner. If there's a crosswalk, I cross the street there. A crosswalk looks like this. Let's go for a ride in the car. Let's go.
You know the great thing about Chow wearing his seat belt or Sam riding her bike safely or Naomi looking both ways before she crosses the street? They're kids, just like you, and they've taken responsibility for their own safety. You know, that's an important part of growing up, is learning how to take care of yourself. And you can do that. You can make safe choices every day. Now, let me give you an example. Suppose a stranger, somebody you don't know, starts talking to you. Suppose this stranger wants to give you something or take you for a ride in their car. What should you do? Well, why don't you take responsibility and find out? Ask your teacher or ask your parents what you should do if a stranger talks to you. You can do it. You can find out what's safe, and that's important. Your home can be a dangerous place. Grown-up things like guns and knives, cleaning materials and medicine, these are not toys. They can hurt you. Electricity is dangerous too. If your house is on fire, the best thing to do is to get out as fast as you can. If there's a lot of smoke, crawl on the ground. If your clothes catch fire, remember, stop, drop, and roll. Learn how to make your bike safe. Always obey street signs and traffic lights. And ride single file so cars can pass. When you go walking, always look both ways before you cross. Cross the street at the corner. Look for a traffic light or a crosswalk. Fasten your seatbelt when you go for a ride in a car. One more thing. If you are in any kind of trouble, get to a telephone. And remember this number, 911. That's the number of the people who can help you, 911. If you're in a fire, if somebody's really sick, or if you're in any kind of trouble at all, dial 911. And have someone show you where those numbers are on the telephone. Bob, Bob, Bob. What, what, what? We what? have a question. Okay, sit down, let's talk about it. Come right in here. Okay, what's up? Well, if you get lost, like, at the mall or in a park, what should you do? Stand still. Yeah, stand still. But I think you should go look for help. No way. Okay, 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 wait a minute. Let's, let's talk about this problem. 